preface and opening poem of the christian secret of a happy life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeff chestnut the christian's secret of a happy life by hannah whitehall smith preface and opening poem what i have to tell in this little book is no new story the early church taught it in the days of the apostles and from those days down to the present time there have been found in every age some whose voices and whose lives have proclaimed it many times it has been lost sight of and the church has seemed to fall into almost hopeless darkness and lifelessness but the secret has always been preserved by an apostolic succession of those who have walked and talked with god in the present day the truth concerning it has been afresh revived and my little book is an effort to tell it again in a way that will be simple enough for all to understand too often the language of religion like the oft-repeated chimes of a bell seems to lose its power to attract attention and it may be that even a bell of inferior tone shall be able to break the careless inattention of some souls i have not tried therefore to make my book theological i could not if i would i have simply sought to tell the blessed story so old and yet so new in the homely and familiar words of everyday life i do not want to change the theological views of a single individual the truths that i have to tell are not theological but practical they are i believe the fundamental truths of life and experience the truths that underlie all theologies and that are in fact their real and vital meaning they will fit in with every creed simply making it possible for those who hold the creed to live up to their own beliefs and to find in them the experimental realities of a present savior and a present salvation most of us acknowledge that there is behind all religions an absolute religion that holds the vital truth of each and it is of this absolute religion my book seeks to treat no doubt it is imperfectly done but i can only trust that all its mistakes may be counteracted and only that which is true may find entrance into any heart the book is sent out in tender sympathy and yearning love for all struggling weary souls of whatever creed or name and its message goes right from my heart to theirs i have given the best i have and can do no more this new and revised issue goes forth on its mission with the prayer that the lord may continue to use it as a voice to teach some who sorely need it the true secret of a happy life hannah whitehall smith philadelphia january eighteen eighty eight the cry of st paul brethren my heart's desire and prayer to god for israel is that they might be saved romans ten one oh could i tell ye surely would believe it oh could i only say what i have seen how should i tell or how can ye receive it how till he bringeth you where i have been therefore lord i will not fail or falter nay but i ask it nay but i desire lay on my lips thine embers of the altar seal with the ring and furnish with the fire give me a voice a cry and a complaining oh let my sound be stormy in their ears throat that would shout but cannot stay for straining eyes that would weep but cannot wait for tears quick in a moment infinite forever send an arousal better than i pray give me a grace upon the faint endeavor souls for my hire and pentecost to-day scarcely i catch the words of his revealing hardly i hear him dimly understand only the power that is within me peeling lives on my lips and beckons with my hand whoso has felt the spirit of the highest cannot confound nor doubt him nor deny 
yea with one voice o world though thou deniest stand thou on that side for on this am i f w h myers end of preface and opening poem recording by jeff chestnut Chapter One of the Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter One Is It Scriptural? No thoughtful person can question the fact that, for the most part, the Christian life, as it is generally lived, is not entirely a happy life. A keen observer once said to me, You Christians seem to have a religion that makes you miserable. You are like a man with a headache. He does not want to get rid of his head, but it hurts him to keep it. You cannot expect outsiders to seek very earnestly for anything so uncomfortable. Then, for the first time I saw, as in a flash, that the religion of Christ ought to be, and was meant to be, to its possessors, not something to make them miserable, but something to make them happy. And I began, then and there, to ask the Lord to show me the secret of a happy Christian life. It is the secret, so far as I have learned it, that I shall try to tell in the following pages. All of God's children, I am convinced, feel instinctively, in their moments of divine illumination, that a life of inward rest and outward victory is their inalienable birthright. Can you not remember, some of you, the shout of triumph your souls gave when you first became acquainted with the Lord Jesus and had a glimpse of his mighty saving power? How sure you were of victory then! How easy it seemed to be more than conquerors through him that loved you. Under the leadership of a captain who had never been foiled in battle, how could you dream of defeat? And yet, to many of you, how different has been your real experience. Your victories have been few and fleeting, your defeats many and disastrous. You have not lived as you feel children of God ought to live. You have had, perhaps, a clear understanding of doctrinal truths, but you have not come into possession of their life and power. You have rejoiced in your knowledge of the things revealed in the scriptures, but have not had a living realization of the things themselves consciously felt in the soul. Christ is believed in, talked about, and served, but he is not known as the soul's actual and very life, abiding there forever and revealing himself there continually in his beauty. You have found Jesus as your Savior from the penalty of sin, but you have not found him as your Savior from its power. You have carefully studied the Holy Scriptures and have gathered much precious truth therefrom, which you have trusted would feed and nourish your spiritual life, but in spite of it all, your souls are starving and dying within you, and you cry out in secret again and again for that bread and water of life which you see promised in the scriptures to all believers. In the very depths of your hearts you know that your experience is not a scriptural experience, that, as an old writer said, your religion is but a talk to what the early Christians enjoyed, possessed, and lived in. And your hearts have sunk within you as day after day and year after year your early visions of triumph have seemed to grow more and more dim, and you have been forced to settle down to the conviction that the best you can expect from your religion is a life of alternate failure and victory, one hour sinning and the next repenting, and then beginning again only to fail again and again to repent. But is this all? 
had the lord jesus only this in his mind when he laid down his precious life to deliver you from your sore and cruel bondage to sin did he propose to himself only this partial deliverance did he intend to leave you thus struggling under a weary consciousness of defeat and discouragement did he fear that a continuous victory would dishonor him and bring reproach on his name when all those declarations were made concerning his coming and the work he was to accomplish did they mean only this that you have experienced was there a hidden reserve in each promise that was meant to deprive it of its complete fulfillment did delivering us out of the hand of our enemies mean that they should still have dominion over us did enabling us always to triumph mean that we were only to triumph sometimes did being made more than conquerors through him that loved us mean constant defeat and failure does being saved to the uttermost mean the meager salvation we see manifested among us now can we dream that the savior who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities could possibly see the travail of his soul and be satisfied in such christian lives as fill the church today the bible tells us that for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and can we imagine for a moment that this is beyond his power and that he finds himself unable to accomplish the thing he was manifested to do in the very outset then settle down on this one thing that jesus came to save you now in this life from the power and dominion of sin and to make you more than conquerors through his power if you doubt this search your bible and collect together every announcement or declaration concerning the purposes and object of his death on the cross you will be astonished to find how full they are everywhere and always his work is said to be to deliver us from our sins from our bondage from our defilement and not a hint is given anywhere that this deliverance was to be only the limited and partial one with which christians so continually try to be satisfied let me give you the teaching of scripture on this subject when the angel of the lord appeared unto joseph in a dream and announced the coming birth of the savior he said and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save his people from their sins when zacharias was filled with the holy ghost at the birth of his son and prophesied he declared that god had visited his people in order to fulfill the promise and the oath he had made them which promise was that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life when peter was preaching in the porch of the temple to the wandering jews he said unto you first god having raised up his son jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities when paul was telling to the ephesian church the wondrous truth that christ had so loved them as to give himself for them he went on to declare that his purpose in thus doing was that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish when paul was seeking to instruct titus his own son after the common faith concerning the grace of god he declared that the object of that grace was to teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world and adds as the reason of this that christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works when peter was urging upon the christians to whom he was writing a holy and christ-like walk he tells them that even hereunto were ye called 
because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, and adds, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. When Paul was contrasting in the Ephesians the walk suitable for a Christian with the walk of an unbeliever, he sets before them the truth of Jesus as being this, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And when, in Romans 6, he was answering forever the question as to a child of God continuing in sin and showing how utterly foreign it was to the whole spirit and aim of the salvation of Jesus, he brings up the fact of our judicial death and resurrection with Christ as an unanswerable argument for our practical deliverance from it, and says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And adds, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It is a fact sometimes overlooked that in the declarations concerning the object of the death of Christ, far more mention is made of a present salvation from sin than of a future salvation in a heaven beyond, showing plainly God's estimate of the relative importance of these two things. Dear Christians, Will you receive the testimony of the Scripture on this matter? The same crucial questions that troubled the church in Paul's day are troubling it now. First, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And second, do we then make void the law through faith? Shall our answer to these be Paul's emphatic, God forbid, and his triumphant assertions that, instead of making a void we establish the law and that what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh god sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit can we for a moment suppose that the holy God who hates sin in the sinner is willing to tolerate it in the Christians, and that he has even arranged the plan of salvation in a way as to make it impossible for those who are saved from the guilt of sin to find deliverance from its power? As Dr. Chalmers well says, Sin is that scandal which must be rooted out from the great spiritual household over which the divinity rejoices. Strange administration indeed, for sin to be so hateful to God as to lay all who had incurred it under death, and yet, when readmitted to life, that sin should be permitted, and that what was before the object of destroying vengeance should now become the object of an upheld and protected toleration. Now that the penalty is taken off, think you it is possible that the unchangeable God has so given up his antipathy to sin as that man, ruined and redeemed man, may now perseveringly indulge under the new arrangement in that which under the old destroyed him? Does not the God who loved righteousness and hated iniquity six thousand years ago bear the same love to righteousness and hatred to iniquity still? I now breathe the air of loving kindness from heaven and can walk before God in peace and graciousness, shall I again attempt the incompatible alliance of two principles so adverse as that of an approving God and a persevering sinner? 
how shall we recovered from so awful a catastrophe continue that which first involved us in it the cross of christ by the same mighty and decisive stroke wherewith it moved the curse of sin away from us also surely moves away the power and the love of it from over us and not dr chalmers only but many other holy men of his generation and of our own as well as of generations long past have united in declaring that the redemption accomplished for us by our lord jesus christ on the cross at calvary is a redemption from the power of sin as well as from its guilt and that he is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto god by him a quaint old quaker divine of the seventeenth century says there is nothing so contrary to god as sin and god will not suffer sin always to rule his masterpiece man when we consider the infiniteness of god's power for destroying that which is contrary to him who can believe that the devil must always stand and prevail i believe it is inconsistent and disagreeable with true faith for people to be christians and yet to believe that christ the eternal son of god to whom all power in heaven and earth is given will suffer sin and the devil to have dominion over them but you will say no man by all the power he hath can redeem himself and no man can live without sin we will say amen to it but if men tell us that when god's power comes to help us and to redeem us out of sin it cannot be effected then this doctrine we cannot away with nor i hope you neither would you approve of it if i should tell you that god puts forth his power to do such a thing but the devil hinders him that it is impossible for god to do it because the devil does not like it that it is impossible that any one should be free from sin because the devil hath got such a power in them that god cannot cast him out this is lamentable doctrine yet hath not this been preached it doth in plain terms say though god doth interpose his power it is impossible because the devil has so rooted sin in the nature of man is not man god's creature and cannot he new make him and cast sin out of him if you say sin is deeply rooted in man i say so too yet not so deeply rooted but christ jesus hath entered so deeply into the root of the nature of man that he hath received power to destroy the devil in his works and to recover and redeem man into righteousness and holiness or else it is false that he is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto god by him we must throw the bible away if we say that it is impossible for god to deliver man out of sin we know he continues when our friends are in captivity as in turkey or elsewhere we pay our money for their redemption but we will not pay our money if they be kept in their fetters still would not any one think himself cheated to pay so much money for their redemption and the bargain be made so that he shall be said to be redeemed and be called a redeemed captive but he must wear his fetters still how long as long as he hath a day to live this is for bodies but now i am speaking of souls christ must be made to me redemption and rescue me from captivity am i a prisoner anywhere yes verily verily he that committeth sin saith christ he is a servant of sin he is a slave of sin if thou hast sinned thou art a slave a captive that must be redeemed out of captivity who will pay a price for me i am poor i have nothing i cannot redeem myself who will pay a price for me there is one come who hath paid a price for me that is well that is good news then i hope i shall come out of my captivity what is his name is he called a redeemer so then i do expect the benefit of my redemption and that i shall go out of my captivity no say they you must abide in sin as long as you live what must we never be delivered must this crooked heart and perverse will always remain 
must i be a believer and yet have no faith that reaches to sanctification and holy living is there no mastery to be had no getting victory over sin must it prevail over me as long as i live what sort of a redeemer then is this or what benefit have i in this life of my redemption similar extracts might be quoted from marshall and romaine and many others to show that this doctrine is no new one in the church however much it may have been lost sight of by the present generation of believers it is the same old story that has filled with songs of triumph the daily lives of many saints of god both catholic and protestant throughout all ages and it is now being sounded forth afresh to the unspeakable joy of weary and burdened souls do not reject it then dear reader until you have prayerfully searched the scriptures to see whether these things be indeed so ask god to open the eyes of your understanding by his spirit that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places and when you have begun to have some faint glimpses of this power learn to look away utterly from your own weakness and putting your case into his hands trust him to deliver you when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou be not afraid of them for the lord thy god is with thee which brought thee up out of the land of egypt and it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them hear o israel ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies let not your hearts faint fear not and do not tremble neither be ye terrified because of them for the lord your god is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you End of chapter 1. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. Chapter 2 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 2 God's Side and Man's Side. Much misunderstanding arises in reference to this subject of the life and walk of faith from the fact that its two sides are not clearly seen people are apt to think that there is only one side to it and dwelling exclusively upon the one they happen to see the most clearly without even a thought of any other it is no wonder that distorted views of the whole matter are the legitimate consequence now there are two very decided and distinct sides to this subject and like all other subjects it cannot be fully understood unless both of these sides are kept constantly in view I refer, of course, to God's side and man's side, or in other words, to God's part in the work of sanctification and man's part. These are very distinct and even contrasting, but although to a cursory observer they may sometimes so appear, they are not really contradictory. At one time this was very strikingly illustrated to me. There were two teachers of this interior life holding meetings in the same place at alternate hours. One spoke only of God's part in the work, and the other dwelt exclusively upon man's part. They were both in perfect sympathy with each other, and realized fully that they were each teaching different sides of the same great truth. And this also was understood by a large proportion of their hearers. But with some of the hearers it was different and one lady said to me in the greatest perplexity i cannot understand it at all here are two preachers undertaking to teach just the same truth 
and yet to me they seemed flatly to contradict each other. And I felt at the time that she expressed a puzzle that, very often, causes great difficulty in the minds of many honest inquirers after this truth. Suppose two friends go to see some celebrated building and return home to describe it. One has seen only the north side, and the other only the south. The first says, the building was built in such a manner and has such and such stories and ornaments. Oh, no, says the other, interrupting him. You are altogether mistaken. I saw the building, and it was built in quite a different manner, and its ornaments and stories were so-and-so. A lively dispute might follow upon the truth of the respective descriptions until the two friends should discover that they had been describing different sides of the building and then all would be reconciled at once. I would like to state, as clearly as I can, what I judge to be the two distinct sides in this matter, and to show how looking at one without seeing the other will be sure to create wrong impressions and views of the truth. To state it in brief, I would say that man's part is to trust, and God's part is to work and it can be seen at a glance how these two parts contrast with each other, and yet are not necessarily contradictory. I mean this. There is a certain work to be accomplished. We are to be delivered from the power of sin, and are to be made perfect in every good work to do the will of God. Beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are to be actually changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A real work is to be wrought in us and upon us. Besetting sins are to be conquered. Evil habits are to be overcome. Wrong dispositions and feelings are to be rooted out, and holy tempers and emotions are to be begotten a positive transformation is to take place. So at least the Bible teaches. Now, somebody must do this. Either we must do it for ourselves, or another must do it for us. We have, most of us, tried to do it for ourselves at first, and have grievously failed. Then we discover from the scriptures and from our own experience that it is something we are unable to do, but that the Lord Jesus Christ has come on purpose to do it, and that he will do it for all who put themselves wholly into his hands and trust him without reserve. Now under these circumstances, what is the part of the believer, and what is the part of the Lord? Plainly, the believer can do nothing but trust, while the Lord, in whom he trusts, actually does the work entrusted to him. Trusting and doing are certainly contrasted things, often indeed contradictory, but are they contradictory in this case? Manifestly not, because it is two different parties that are concerned. If we should say of one party in a transaction that he trusted his case to another and yet attended to it himself, we should state a contradiction and an impossibility. But when we say of two parties in a transaction that one trusts the other to do something and that the other goes to work and does it, we are stating something that is perfectly simple and harmonious. When we say, therefore, that in this higher life man's part is to trust, and God's part is to do the thing entrusted to him, we do not surely present any very difficult or puzzling problem. The preacher, who is speaking on man's part in the matter, cannot speak of anything but surrender and trust, because this is positively all the man can do. We all agree about this. And yet such preachers are constantly criticized as though, in saying this, they had meant to imply there was no other part, and that therefore nothing but trusting is to be done. And the cry goes out that this doctrine of faith does away with all realities, that souls are just told to trust, and there is the end of it, and that they sit down thenceforward in a sort of religious easy chair, dreaming away a life fruitless of any actual result. 
all this misapprehension arises of course from the fact that either the preacher has neglected to state or the hearer has failed to hear the other side of the matter which is that when we trust the lord works and that a great deal is done not by us but by him actual results are reached by our trusting because our lord undertakes the thing entrusted to him and accomplishes it we do not do anything but he does it and it is all the more effectually done because of this as soon as this is clearly seen the difficulty as to the preaching of faith disappears entirely on the other hand the preacher who dwells on god's part in the matter is criticized on a totally different ground he does not speak of trust for the lord's part is not to trust but to work the lord's part is to do the thing entrusted to him he disciplines and trains by inward exercises and outward providences he brings to bear upon us all the refining and purifying resources of his wisdom and his love he makes everything in our lives and circumstances subservient to the one great purpose of causing us to grow in grace and of conforming us day by day and hour by hour to the image of christ he carries us through a process of transformation longer or shorter as our peculiar case may require making actual and experimental the result for which we have trusted we have dared for instance according to the command in romans six eleven by faith to reckon ourselves dead unto sin the lord makes this a reality and puts us to death by a thousand little mortifications and crosses to the natural man our reckoning is available only because god thus makes it real and yet the preacher who dwells upon this practical side of the matter and tells of god's processes for making faith's reckonings experimental realities may be accused of contradicting the preaching of faith altogether and of declaring only a process of gradual sanctification by works and of setting before the soul an impossible and hopeless task now sanctification is both a step of faith and a process of works it is a step of surrender and trust on our part and it is a process of development on god's part by a step of faith we get into christ by a process we are made to grow up into him in all things by a step of faith we put ourselves into the hands of the divine potter by a gradual process he makes us into a vessel unto his own honor meet for his use and prepared to every good work to illustrate this suppose i were to describe to a person who is entirely ignorant of the subject the way in which a lump of clay is made into a beautiful vessel i tell him first the part of the clay in the matter and all i can say about this is that the clay is put into the potter's hand and then lies passive there submitting itself to all the turnings and overturnings of the potter's hands upon it there is really nothing else to be said about the clay's part but could my hearer argue from this that nothing else is done because i say that this is all the clay can do if he is an intelligent hearer he will not dream of doing so but will say i understand this is what the clay must do but what must the potter do ah i answer now we come to the important part the potter takes the clay thus abandoned to his working and begins to mold and fashion it according to his own will he kneads and works it he tears it apart and presses it together again he wets it and then suffers it to dry sometimes he works at it for hours together sometimes he lays it aside for days and does not touch it and then when by all these processes he has made it perfectly pliable in his hands he proceeds to make it up into the vessel he has proposed he turns it upon the wheel planes it and smooths it and dries it in the sun bakes it in the oven and finally turns it out of his workshop a vessel to his honor and fit for his use will my reader be likely now to say that i am contradicting myself that a little while ago 
I had said the clay had nothing to do but lie passive in the potter's hands, and that I am now putting upon it a great work which it is not able to perform, and that to make itself into such a vessel is an impossible and hopeless undertaking? Surely not, for he will see that while before I was speaking of the clay's part in the matter, I am now speaking of the potter's part, and that these two are necessarily contrasted, but not in the least contradictory, and that the clay is not expected to do the potter's work, but only to yield itself up to his working. Nothing, it seems to me, could be clearer than the perfect harmony between these two apparently contradictory sorts of teaching. What can be said about man's part in this great work but that he must continually surrender himself and continually trust? But when we come to God's side of the question, what is there that may not be said as to the manifold and wonderful ways in which he accomplishes the work entrusted to him? It is here that the growing comes in. The lump of clay could never grow into a beautiful vessel if it stayed in the clay pit for thousands of years, but when it is put into the hands of a skillful potter, it grows rapidly, under his fashioning, into the vessel he intends it to be. And in the same way the soul, abandoned to the working of the heavenly potter, is made into a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Having, therefore, taken the step of faith by which you have put yourself wholly and absolutely into his hands, you must now expect him to begin to work. His way of accomplishing that which you have entrusted to him may be different from your way, but he knows, and you must be satisfied. I knew a lady who had entered into this life of faith with a great outpouring of the Spirit and a wonderful flood of light and joy. She supposed, of course, this was a preparation for some great service and expected to be put forth immediately into the Lord's harvest field. Instead of this, almost at once her husband lost all his money and she was shut up in her own house to attend to all sorts of domestic duties with no time or strength left for any gospel work at all. She accepted the discipline and yielded herself up as heartily to sweep and dust and bake and sew as she would have done to preach or pray or write for the Lord. And the result was that, through this very training, he made her into a vessel meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Another lady who had entered this life of faith under similar circumstances of wondrous blessing, and who also expected to be sent out to do some great work, was shut up with two peevish invalid children to nurse and humor and amuse all day long. Unlike the first one, this lady did not accept the training, but chafed and fretted, and finally rebelled, lost all her blessing, and went back into a state of sad coldness and misery. She had understood her part of trusting to begin with, but, not understanding the divine process of accomplishing that for which she had trusted, she took herself out of the hands of the heavenly potter, and the vessel was marred on the wheel. I believe many a vessel has been similarly marred, by a want of understanding these things. The maturity of a Christian experience cannot be reached in a moment, but is the result of the work of God's Holy Spirit, who, by His energizing and transforming power, causes us to grow up into Christ in all things. And we cannot hope to reach this maturity in any other way than by yielding ourselves up, utterly and willingly, to His mighty working but the sanctification the scriptures urge as a present experience upon all believers does not consist in maturity of growth, but in purity of heart, and this may be as complete in the early as in our later experiences. The lump of clay from the moment it comes under the transforming hand of the potter is, during each day and each hour of the process, just what the potter wants it to be at that hour or on that day, and therefore pleases him. 
but it is very far from being matured into the vessel he intends in the future to make it. The little babe may be all that a babe could be or ought to be, and may therefore perfectly please its mother, and yet it is very far from being what that mother would wish it to be when the years of maturity shall come. The apple in June is a perfect apple for June. It is the best apple that June can produce, but it is a very different apple from the apple in October, which is a perfected apple. God's works are perfect in every stage of their growth. Man's works are never perfect until they are in every respect complete. All that we claim, then, in this life of sanctification is that by an act of faith we put ourselves into the hands of the Lord for Him to work in us all the good pleasure of His will, and then by a continuous exercise of faith keep ourselves there. This is our part in the matter, and when we do it, and while we do it, we are, in the scripture sense, truly pleasing to God, although it may require years of training and discipline to mature us into a vessel that shall be in all respects to His honor and fitted to every good work. Our part is the trusting. It is His to accomplish the results. And when we do our part, He never fails to do His, for no one ever trusted in the Lord and was confounded. Do not be afraid, then, that, if you trust or tell others to trust, the matter will end there. Trust is the beginning and the continuing foundation, but when we trust, the Lord works, and His work is the important part of the whole matter. And this explains that apparent paradox which puzzles so many. They say, in one breath, you tell us to do nothing but trust, and in the next, you tell us to do impossible things. How can you reconcile such contradictory statements? They are to be reconciled just as we reconcile the statements concerning a saw in a carpenter's shop when we say at one moment that the saw has sawn asunder a log and the next moment declared that the carpenter has done it. The saw is the instrument used, the power that uses it is the carpenter's. And so we, yielding ourselves unto God, and our members as instruments of righteousness unto Him, find that He works in us to will and to do His good pleasure, and we can say with Paul, I labored, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. In the divine order, God's working depends upon our cooperation. Of our Lord it was declared that at a certain place He could do there no mighty work because of their unbelief. It was not that He would not, but He could not. I believe we often think of God that He will not, when the real truth is that He cannot. Just as the potter, however skillful, cannot make a beautiful vessel out of a lump of clay that is never put into his hands, so neither can God make out of me a vessel unto his honor unless I put myself into his hands. My part is the essential correlation of God's part in the matter of my salvation, and as God is sure to do his part all right, the vital thing for me is to find out what my part is and then do it. In this book, therefore, I shall of course dwell mostly on man's side, as I am writing for human beings, and in the hope of making it plain how we are to fulfill our part of this great work. But I wish it to be distinctly understood all through, that unless I believe with all my heart in God's effectual working on His side, not one word of this book would ever have been written. End of chapter 2 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 3 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith Chapter 3 The Life Defined 
in the first chapter i have tried to settle the question as to the scripturalness of the experience sometimes called the higher christian life but which is the only true christian life and which to my own mind is best described in the words the life hid with christ in god in the second i have sought to reconcile the two distinct sides of this life that is the part to be done by the lord and the part necessarily to be done by ourselves i shall now therefore consider it as a settled point that the scriptures do set before the believer in the lord jesus a life of abiding rest and of continual victory which is very far beyond the ordinary run of christian experience and that in the bible we have presented to us a saviour able to save us from the power of our sins as really as he saves us from their guilt the point to be next considered is as to what are the chief characteristics of this life hid with christ in god and how it differs from much in the ordinary christian experience its chief characteristics are an entire surrender to the lord and a perfect trust in him resulting in victory over sin and inward rest of the soul and it differs from the lower range of christian experience in that it causes us to let the lord carry our burdens and manage our affairs for us instead of trying to do it ourselves most christians are like a man who was toiling along the road bending under a heavy burden when a wagon overtook him and the driver kindly offered to help him on his journey he joyfully accepted the offer but when seated in the wagon continued to bend beneath his burden which he still kept on his shoulders why do you not lay down your burden asked the kind-hearted driver oh replied the man i feel that it is almost too much to ask you to carry me and i could not think of letting you carry my burden too and so christians who have given themselves into the care and keeping of the lord jesus still continue to bend beneath the weight of their burdens and often go weary and heavy laden through the whole length of their journey when i speak of burdens i mean everything that troubles us whether spiritual or temporal i mean first of all ourselves the greatest burden we have to carry in life is self the most difficult thing we have to manage is self our own daily living our frames and feelings our especial weaknesses and temptations our peculiar temperaments our inward affairs of every kind these are the things that perplex and worry us more than anything else and that brings us most frequently into bondage and darkness in laying off your burdens therefore the first one you must get rid of is yourself you must hand yourself with your temptations your temperament your frames and feelings and all your inward and outward experiences over into the care and keeping of your god and leave it all there he made you and therefore he understands you and knows how to manage you and you must trust him to do it say to him here lord i abandon myself to thee i have tried in every way i could think of to manage myself and to make myself what i know i ought to be but have always failed now i give it up to thee do thou take entire possession of me work in me all the good pleasure of thy will mould and fashion me into such a vessel as seemeth good to thee i leave myself in thy hands and i believe thou wilt according to thy promise make me into a vessel unto thy own honour sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work and here you must rest trusting yourself thus to him continually and absolutely next you must lay off every other burden your health your reputation your christian work your houses your children your business your servants everything in short that concerns you whether inward or outward it is generally much less difficult for us to commit the keeping of our future to the lord than it is to commit our present we know we are helpless as regards the future but we feel as if the present was in our own hands and must be carried on our own shoulders and most of us have an unconfessed idea that it is a great deal to ask of the lord to carry ourselves and that we cannot think of asking him to carry our burdens too 
I knew a Christian lady who had a very heavy temporal burden. It took away her sleep and her appetite, and there was danger of her health breaking down under it. One day, when it seemed especially heavy, she noticed lying on the table near her a little tract called Hannah's Faith. Attracted by the title, she picked it up and began to read it, little knowing, however, that it was to create a revolution in her whole experience. The story was of a poor woman who had been carried triumphantly through a life of unusual sorrow. She was giving the history of her life to a kind visitor on one occasion, and at the close the visitor said feelingly, Oh, Hannah, I do not see how you could bear so much sorrow. I did not bear it, was the quick reply. The Lord bore it for me. Yes, said the visitor, that is the right way. We must take our troubles to the Lord. Yes, replied Hannah, but we must do more than that. We must leave them there. Most people, she continued, take their burdens to him, but they bring them away with them again, and are just as worried and unhappy as ever. But I take mine, and I leave them with him, and come away and forget them. If the worry comes back, I take it to him again, and I do this over and over, until at last I just forget I have any worries, and am at perfect rest. My friend was very much struck with this plan, and resolved to try it. The circumstances of her life she could not alter, but she took them to the Lord and handed them over into his management. And then she believed that he took it, and she left all the responsibility and the worry and anxiety with him. As often as the anxieties returned, she took them back, and the result was that, although the circumstances remained unchanged, her soul was kept in perfect peace in the midst of them. She felt that she had found out a practical secret and from that time she sought never to carry her own burdens, nor to manage her own affairs, but to hand them over as fast as they arose to the divine burden-bearer. This same secret also, which she had found to be so effectual in her outward life, proved to be still more effectual in her inward life, which was, in truth, even more utterly unmanageable. She abandoned her whole self to the Lord, with all that she was and all that she had, and, believing that he took that which she had committed to him, she ceased to fret and worry, and her life became all sunshine in the gladness of belonging to him. It was a very simple secret she found out, only this, that it was possible to obey God's commandment contained in those words, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and that, in obeying it, the result would inevitably be, according to the promise that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There are many other things to be said about this life hid with Christ and God, many details as to what the Lord Jesus does for those who thus abandon themselves to him. But the gist of the whole matter is here stated, and the soul that has discovered this secret of simple faith has found the key that will unlock the whole treasure house of God. I am sure these pages will fall into the hands of some child of God who is hungering for just such a life as I have been describing. You long unspeakably to get rid of your weary burdens. You would be delighted to hand over the management of your unmanageable self into the hands of one who is able to manage you. You are tired and weary, and the rest I speak of looks unutterably sweet to you. Do you recollect the delicious sense of rest with which you have sometimes gone to bed at night after a day of great exertion and weariness? How delightful was the sensation of relaxing every muscle and letting your body go in a perfect abandonment of ease and comfort. The strain of the day had ceased for a few hours at least and the work of the day had been laid off. You no longer had to hold up an aching head or a weary back. You trusted yourself to the bed in an absolute confidence, and it held you up without effort or strain or even thought on your part. You rested. But suppose you had doubted the strength or the stability of your bed, and had dreaded each moment to find it giving away beneath you 
and landing on you on the floor. Could you have rested then? Would not every muscle have been strained in a fruitless effort to hold yourself up? And would not the weariness have been greater than if you had not gone to bed at all? Let this analogy teach you what it means to rest in the Lord. Let your souls lie down upon the couch of His sweet will as your bodies lie down in their beds at night. Relax every strain and lay off every burden. Let yourself go in a perfect abandonment of ease and comfort, sure that, since He holds you up, you are perfectly safe. Your part is simply to rest. His part is to sustain you, and He cannot fail. Or take another analogy which our Lord Himself has abundantly sanctioned, that of the child life. For Jesus called a little child unto Him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what are the characteristics of a little child, and how does it live? It lives by faith, and its chief characteristic is freedom from care. Its life is one long trust from year's end to year's end. It trusts its parents, it trusts its caretakers, it trusts its teachers, it even trusts people sometimes who are utterly unworthy of trust out of the abounding trustfulness of its nature. And this trust is abundantly answered. The child provides nothing for itself, and yet everything is provided. It takes no thought for the morrow and forms no plans, and yet all its life is planned out for it, and it finds its paths made ready, opening out as it comes to them day by day, hour by hour. It goes in and out of its father's house with an unspeakable ease and abandonment, enjoying all the good things therein, without having spent a penny in procuring them. Pestilence may walk through the streets of its city, but the child regards it not. Famine and fire and war may rage around it, but under its father's tender care the child abides in utter unconcern and perfect rest. It lives in the present moment, and receives its life unquestioningly, as it comes to it day by day from its father's hands. I was visiting once at a wealthy home where there was a little adopted child, upon whom was lavished all the love and tenderness and care that human hearts could bestow, or human means procure. And as I watched that child running in and out day by day, free and light-hearted with the happy carelessness of childhood, I thought what a picture it was of our wonderful position as children in the house of our Heavenly Father. And I said to myself, if nothing would so grieve and wound the loving hearts around her as to see this little child beginning to be worried or anxious about herself in any way, about whether her food and clothes would be provided, or how she was to get her education or her future support, how much more must the great loving heart of our God and Father be grieved and wounded at seeing his children taking so much anxious care and thought? And I understood why it was that our Lord had said to us so emphatically, Take no thought for yourselves. Who is the best cared for in every household? Is it not the little children? And does not the least of all the helpless baby receive the largest share? We all know that the baby toils not, neither does it spin, and yet it is fed and clothed and loved and rejoiced in more tenderly than the hardest worker of them all. This life of faith, then, about which I am writing, consists in just this, being a child in the Father's house. And when this is said, enough is said to transform every weary, burdened life into one of blessedness and rest. Let the ways of childish confidence and freedom from care, which so please you and win your hearts and your own little ones, teach you what should be your ways with God, and leaving yourself in His hands, learn to be literally careful for nothing, and you shall find it to be a fact that the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep, as with a garrison, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. This is the divine description of the life of faith about which I am writing. It is no speculative theory, neither is it a dream of romance. 
there is such a thing as having one soul kept in perfect peace now and here in this life and childlike trust in god is the key to its attainment end of chapter three recording by jeff chestnut Chapter 4 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 4 How to Enter In. Having sought to settle the question as to the scripturalness of an actual living of this life hid with Christ in God, and having also shown a little of what it is, the next point is as how it is to be reached and realized. I would say, first of all, that this blessed life must not be looked upon in any sense as an attainment, but as an obtainment. We cannot earn it, we cannot climb up to it, we cannot win it we can do nothing but ask for it and receive it. It is the gift of God in Christ Jesus. And where a thing is a gift, the only course left for the receiver is to take it and thank the giver. We never say of a gift, see to what I have attained, and boast of our skill and wisdom in having attained it, but we say, see what has been given me, and boast of the love and wealth and generosity of the giver and everything in our salvation is a gift from beginning to end god is the giver and we are the receivers and it is not for those who do great things but to those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness that the richest promises are made in order therefore to enter into a practical experience of this interior life the soul must be in a receptive attitude, fully recognizing the fact that it is God's gift in Christ Jesus, and that it cannot be gained by any efforts or works of our own. This will simplify the matter exceedingly, and the only thing left to be considered then will be to discover upon whom God bestows this gift, and how they are to receive it. To this I would answer, in short, that he can bestow it only upon the fully consecrated soul, and that it is to be received by faith. Consecration is the first thing, not in any legal sense, not in order to purchase or deserve the blessing, but to remove the difficulties out of the way and make it possible for God to bestow it. In order for a lump of clay to be made into a beautiful vessel, it must be entirely abandoned to the potter and must lie passive in his hands. And similarly, in order for a soul to be made into a vessel unto God's honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work, it must be utterly abandoned to him and must lie passive in his hands. This is manifest at the first glance. I was once trying to explain to a physician who had charge of a large hospital the necessity and meaning of consecration, but he seemed unable to understand. At last I said to him, Suppose in going your rounds among your patients you should meet with one man who entreated you earnestly to take his case under your especial care in order to cure him, but who should at the same time refuse to tell you all his symptoms or to take all your prescribed remedies and should say to you i am quite willing to follow your directions as to certain things because they commend themselves to my mind as good but in other matters i prefer judging for myself and following my own directions what would you do in such a case i asked do he replied with indignation do i would soon leave such a man as that to his own care for of course he added I could do nothing for him unless he would put his whole case into my hands without any reserves and would obey my directions implicitly. It is necessary, then, I said, for doctors to be obeyed if they are to have any chance to cure their patient. 
implicitly obeyed, was his emphatic reply, and that is consecration, I continued. God must have the whole case put into his hands without any reserves, and his directions must be implicitly followed. I see it, he exclaimed, I see it, and I will do it. God shall have his own way with me from henceforth. To some minds, perhaps, the word abandonment might express this idea better than the word consecration. But whatever word we use, we mean an entire surrender of the whole being to God, spirit, soul, and body, placed under his absolute control, for him to do with us just what he pleases. We mean that the language of our hearts, under all circumstances and in view of every act, is to be, Thy will be done. We mean the giving up of all liberty of choice. We mean a life of inevitable obedience. To a soul ignorant of God, this may look hard, but to those who know him it is the happiest and most restful of lives. He is our Father, and he loves us, and he knows just what is best, and therefore, of course, his will is the very most blessed thing that can come to us under any circumstances. I do not understand how it is that the eyes of so many Christians have been blinded to this fact, but it really would seem as if God's own children were more afraid of his will than of anything else in life. His lovely, lovable will, which only means loving kindness and tender mercies and blessings unspeakable to their souls, I wish I could only show to every one the unfathomable sweetness of the will of God. Heaven is a place of infinite bliss because his will is perfectly done there, and our lives share in this bliss just in proportions as his will is perfectly done in them. He loves us, loves us, I say, and the will of love is always blessing for its loved one. Some of us know what it is to love, and we know that could we only have our way, our beloved ones would be overwhelmed with blessings. All that is good and sweet and lovely in life would be poured out upon them from our lavish hands, had we but the power to carry out our will for them. And if this is the way of love with us, how much more must it be so with our God, who is love itself? Could we but for one moment get a glimpse into the mighty depths of his love, our hearts would spring out to meet his will and embrace it as our richest treasure and we would abandon ourselves to it with an enthusiasm of gratitude and joy that such a wondrous privilege could be ours. A great many Christians seem practically to think that all their Father in Heaven wants is a chance to make them miserable and to take away all their blessings, and they imagine, poor souls, that if they hold on to things in their own will, they can hinder Him from doing this. I am ashamed to write the words, yet we must face a fact which is making wretched hundreds of lives. A Christian who was in a great deal of trouble was recounting to another Christian the various efforts he had made to find deliverance and concluded by saying, But it has all been in vain, and there is literally nothing left for me to do now but to trust the Lord. Alas! exclaimed his friend in a tone of the deepest commiseration, as though no greater risk were possible, Alas, has it come to that? A Christian lady who had this feeling was once expressing to a friend how impossible she found it to say, Thy will be done, and how afraid she should be to do it. She was the mother of an only little boy who was the heir to a great fortune and the idol of her heart. After she had stated her difficulties fully, her friend said, Suppose your little Charlie should come running to you tomorrow and say, Mother, I have made up my mind to let you have your own way with me from this time forward. I am always going to obey you, and I want you to do just whatever you think best with me. I will trust your love. How would you feel towards him? Would you say to yourself, Ah, now I shall have a chance to make Charlie miserable. I will take away all his pleasures and fill his life with every hard and disagreeable thing that I can find. I will compel him to do just the things that are the most difficult for him to do, and will give him all sorts of impossible commands. 
oh no 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 exclaimed the indignant mother you know i would not you know i would hug him to my heart and cover him with kisses and would hasten to fill his life with all that was sweetest and best and are you more tender and more loving than god asked her friend ah no was the reply i see my mistake of course i must not be any more afraid of saying thy will be done to my heavenly father than i would want my charlie to be of saying it to me better and sweeter than health or friends or money or fame or ease or prosperity is the adorable will of our god it gilds the darkest hours with a divine halo and sheds brightest sunshine on the gloomiest paths he always reigns who has made it his kingdom and nothing can go amiss to him surely then it is only a glorious privilege that is opening before you when i tell you that the first step you must take in order to enter the life hid with christ in god is that of entire consecration i beg of you not to look at it as a hard and stern demand you must do it gladly thankfully enthusiastically you must go in on what i call the privileged side of consecration and i can assure you from the universal testimony of all who have tried it that you will find it the happiest place you have ever entered yet faith is the next thing after surrender faith is an absolutely necessary element in the reception of any gift for let our friends give a thing to us ever so fully it is not really ours until we believe it has been given and claim it as our own above all this is true in gifts which are purely mental or spiritual love may be lavished upon us by another without stint or measure but until we believe that we are loved it never really becomes ours i suppose most christians understand this principle in reference to the matter of their forgiveness they know that the forgiveness of sins through jesus might have been preached to them forever but it would never really have become theirs until they believe this preaching and claim the forgiveness as their own but when it comes to living the christian life they lose sight of this principle and think that having been saved by faith they are now to live by works and efforts and instead of continuing to receive they are now to begin to do this makes our declaration that the life hid with christ in god is to be entered by faith seem perfectly unintelligible to them and yet it is plainly declared that as we have received christ jesus our lord so are we to walk in him we received him by faith and by faith alone therefore we are to walk in him by faith and by faith alone and the faith by which we enter into this hidden life is just the same as the faith by which we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of god's dear son only it lays hold of a different thing then we believed that jesus was our savior from the guilt of sin and according to our faith it was unto us now we must believe that he is our savior from the power of sin and according to our faith it shall be unto us then we trusted him for forgiveness and it became ours now we must trust him for righteousness and it shall become ours also then we took him as a savior in the future from the penalties of our sins now we must take him as a savior in the present from the bondage of our sins then he was our redeemer now he is to be our life then he lifted us out of the pit now he is to seat us in heavenly places with himself i mean all this of course experimentally and practically theologically and judicially i know that every believer has everything as soon as he is converted but experimentally nothing is his until by faith he claims it every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that i have given to you god hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ but until we set the foot of faith upon them they do not practically become ours according to our faith is always the limit and the rule but this faith of which i am speaking must be a present faith no faith that is exercised in the future tense amounts to anything 
a man may believe forever that his sins will be forgiven at some future time and he will never find peace he has to come to the now belief and say by a present appropriating faith my sins are now forgiven before his soul can be at rest and similarly no faith that looks for a future deliverance from the power of sin will ever lead a soul into the life we are describing the enemy delights in this future faith for he knows it is powerless to accomplish any practical results but he trembles and flees when the soul of the believer dares to claim a present deliverance and to reckon itself now to be free from his power perhaps no four words in the language have more meaning in them than the following which i would have you repeat over and over with your voice and with your soul emphasizing each time a different word jesus saves me now it is he jesus saves me now it is his work to save jesus saves me now i am the one to be saved jesus saves me now he is doing it every moment to sum up then in order to enter into this blessed interior life of rest and triumph you have two steps to take first entire abandonment and second absolute faith no matter what may be the complications of your peculiar experience no matter what your difficulties or your surroundings or your peculiar temperament these two steps definitely taken and unwaveringly persevered in will certainly bring you out sooner or later into the green pastures and still waters of this life hid with christ in god you may be perfectly sure of this and if you will let every other consideration go and simply devote your attention to these two points and be very clear and definite about them your progress will be rapid and your soul will reach its desired haven far sooner than you can now think possible shall i repeat the steps that there may be no mistake you are a child of god and long to please him you love your divine master and are sick and weary of the sin that grieves him you long to be delivered from its power everything you have hitherto tried has failed to deliver you and now in your despair you are asking if it can indeed be as these happy people say that jesus is able and willing to deliver you surely you must know in your very soul that he is that to save you out of the hand of all your enemies is in fact just the very thing he came to do commit your case to him in an absolute unreserve and believe that he undertakes it and at once knowing what he is and what he has said claim that he does even now save you just as you believed at first that he delivered you from the guilt of sin because he said it so now believe that he delivers you from the power of sin because he says it let your faith now lay hold of a new power in christ you have trusted him as your dying savior now trust him as your living savior just as much as he came to deliver you from future punishment did he also come to deliver you from present bondage just as truly as he came to bear your stripes for you he has come to live your life for you you are as utterly powerless in the one case as in the other you could as easily have got yourself rid of your own sins as you can now accomplish for yourself practical righteousness christ and christ only must do both for you and your part in both cases is simply to give the thing to him to do and then believe that he does it a lady now very imminent in this life of trust when she was seeking in great darkness and perplexity to enter in said to the friend who was trying to help her you all say abandon yourself and trust but i do not know how i wish you would just do it out loud so that i may see how you do it shall i do it out loud for you lord jesus i believe that thou art able and willing to deliver me from all the care and unrest and bondage of my christian life i believe thou didst die to set me free not only in the future but now and here i believe thou art stronger than sin 
and that thou canst keep me even me in my extreme of weakness from falling into its snares or yielding obedience to its commands and lord i am going to trust thee to keep me i have tried keeping myself and have failed and failed most grievously i am absolutely helpless so now i will trust thee i give myself to thee i keep back no reserves body soul and spirit i present myself to thee as a piece of clay to be fashioned into anything thy love and thy wisdom shall choose and now i am thine i believe thou dost accept that which i present to thee i believe that this poor weak foolish heart has been taken possession of by thee and that thou hast even at this very moment began to work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure i trust thee utterly and i trust thee now a man was obliged to descend into a deep well by sliding down a fixed rope which was supposed to be of ample length but to his dismay he came to the end of it before his feet had touched the bottom he had not the strength to climb up again and to let go and drop seemed to him but to be dashed to pieces in the depths below he held on until his strength was utterly exhausted and then dropped as he thought to his death he fell just three inches and found himself safe on the rock bottom are you afraid to take this step does it seem too sudden too much like a leap in the dark do you not know that the step of faith always falls on the seeming void but finds the rock beneath if ever you are to enter this glorious land flowing with milk and honey you must sooner or later step into the brimming waters for there is no other path and to do it now may save you months and even years of disappointment and grief hear the word of the lord have i not commanded thee be strong and of good courage be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whithersoever thou goest End of chapter 4. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. Chapter 5 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 5 Difficulties Concerning Consecration. It is very important that Christians should not be ignorant of the temptations that seem to stand ready to oppose every onward step of their progress heavenward and that are especially active when the soul is awakened to a hunger and thirst after righteousness and begins to reach out after the fullness that is ours in christ one of the greatest of these temptations is a difficulty concerning consecration the seeker after holiness is told that he must consecrate himself and he endeavors to do so but at once he meets with the difficulty he has done it as he thinks and yet he finds no difference in his experience. Nothing seems changed as he had been led to expect it would be, and he is completely baffled and asks the question almost despairingly, How am I to know when I am consecrated? The one chief temptation that meets the soul at this juncture is the same that assaults it all along the pathway at every step of its progress, namely, the question as to feelings we cannot believe we are consecrated until we feel that we are and because we do not feel that god has taken us in hand we cannot believe that he has as usual we put feeling first and faith second and the fact last of all now god's invariable rule in everything is fact first faith second and feeling last of all and it is striving against the inevitable when we seek to change this order 
the way then to meet this temptation in reference to consecration is simply to take god's side in the matter and to adopt his order by putting faith before feeling give yourself to the lord definitely and fully according to your present light asking the holy spirit to show you all that is contrary to him either in your heart or life if he shows you anything give it to the lord immediately and say in reference to it thy will be done if he shows you nothing then you must believe that there is nothing and must conclude that you have given him all then recognize that it must be the fact that when you give yourself to god he accepts you and at once let your faith take hold of this fact begin to believe and hold on to it steadfastly that he has taken that which you have surrendered to him you positively must not wait to feel either that you have given yourself or that god has taken you you must simply believe it and reckon it to be the case and if you are steadfast in this reckoning sooner or later the feeling will come and you will realize that it is indeed a blessed fact that you are wholly the lord's if you were to give an estate to a friend you would have to give it and he would have to receive it by faith an estate is not a thing that can be picked up and handed over to another the gift of it and its reception are altogether a transaction by word and on paper and therefore one of faith now if you should give an estate one day to a friend and then should go away and wonder whether you really had given it and whether he had actually taken it and considered it his own and should feel it necessary to go the next day and renew the gift and if on the third day you should still feel a similar uncertainty about it and should again go and renew the gift and on the fourth day go through a like process and so on day after day for months and years what would your friend think and what at last would be the condition of your own mind in reference to it your friend would certainly begin to doubt whether you ever had intended to give it to him at all and you yourself would be in such hopeless perplexity about it that you would not know whether the estate was yours or his or whose it was now is not this very much the way in which you have been acting toward god in this matter of consecration you have given yourself to him over and over daily perhaps for months but you have invariably come away from your seasons of consecration wondering whether you really have given yourself after all and whether he has taken you and because you have not felt any change you have concluded at last after many painful tossings that the thing has not been done do you know dear believer that this sort of perplexity will last for ever until you cut it short by faith you must come to the point of reckoning the matter to be an accomplished and settled thing and must leave it there before you can possibly expect any change of feeling whatever the levitical law of offerings to god settles this as a primary fact that everything which is given to him becomes by that very act something holy set apart from all other things something that cannot without sacrilege be put to any other uses notwithstanding no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the lord of all that he hath both of man and beast and of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed every devoted thing is most holy unto the lord having once given it to the lord the devoted thing henceforth was reckoned by all israel as being the lord's and no one dared to stretch forth a hand to retake it the giver might have made his offering very grudgingly and half-heartedly but having made it the matter was taken out of his hands altogether and the devoted thing by god's own law became most holy unto the lord it was not made holy by the state of mind of the giver but by the holiness of the divine receiver the altar sanctifies the gift and an offering once laid upon the altar from that moment belonged to the lord i can imagine an offerer after he had deposited a gift beginning to search his heart as to his sincerity and honesty in doing it and coming back to the priest to say that he was afraid after all he had not given it rightly or had not been perfectly sincere in giving it 
I feel sure the priest would have silenced him at once, saying, As to how you gave your offering, or what were your motives in giving it, I do not know. The facts are that you did give it, and that it is the Lord's, for every devoted thing is most holy unto him. It is too late to recall the transaction now. And not only the priest, but all Israel would have been aghast at the man who, having once given his offering, should have reached out his hand to take it back. Yet, day after day, earnest-hearted Christians with no thought of the sacrilege they are committing are guilty in their own experience of a similar act by giving themselves to the Lord in solemn consecration and then, through unbelief, taking back that which they have given. Because God is not visibly present to the eye, it is difficult to feel that a transaction with him is real. I suppose that if, when we made our acts of consecration, we could actually see him present with us, we should feel it to be a very real thing, and would realize that we had given our word to him, and could not dare to take it back, no matter how much we might wish to do so. Such a transaction would have to us the binding power that a spoken promise to an earthly friend always has to a man of honor. What we need, therefore, is to see that God's presence is a certain fact always, and that every act of our soul is done before Him, and that a word spoken in prayer is as really spoken to Him as if our eyes could see Him and our hands could touch Him. Then we shall cease to have such vague conceptions of our relations with Him and shall feel the binding force of every word we say in his presence. I know some will say here, Ah, yes, but if he would only speak to me and say that he took me when I gave myself to him, I would have no trouble then in believing it. No, of course you would not. But then where would be the room for faith? Sight is not faith, and hearing is not faith, neither is feeling faith. But believing when we can neither see, hear, nor feel is faith, and everywhere the Bible tells us our salvation is to be by faith. Therefore we must believe before we feel, and often against our feelings, if we would honor God by our faith. It is always he that believeth who has the witness, not he that doubteth. But how can we doubt, since by his very command to us, to present ourselves to him a living sacrifice, he has pledged himself to receive us? I cannot conceive of an honorable man asking another to give him a thing which, after all, he was doubtful about taking. Still less can I conceive of a loving parent acting so toward a beloved child. My son, give me thy heart is a sure warrant for knowing that the moment the heart is given, it will be taken by the one who has commanded the gift. We may, nay, we must, feel the utmost confidence, then, that when we surrender ourselves to the Lord according to his own command, he does then and there receive us, and from that moment we are his. A real transaction has taken place which cannot be violated without dishonor on our part, and which we know will not be violated by him. In Deuteronomy 26, 17-19, we see God's way of working under these circumstances. Thou hast avouched to the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldst keep all his commandments, and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. When we avouch the Lord to be our God, and that we will walk in his ways and keep his commandments, he avouches us to be his, and that we shall keep all his commandments and from that moment he takes possession of us. This has always been his principle of working, and it continues to be so. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. This is so plain as not to admit of a question. But if the soul still feels in doubt or difficulty, 
let me refer you to a new testament declaration which approaches the subject from a different side but which settles it i think quite as definitely it is in first john verses fourteen and fifteen and reads and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us and if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him is it according to his will that you should be entirely surrendered to him there can be of course but one answer to this for he has commanded it is it not also according to his will that he should work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure this question can also have but one answer for he has declared it to be his purpose you know then that these things are according to his will therefore on god's own word you are obliged to know that he hears you and knowing this much you are compelled to go farther and know that you have the petitions that you have desired of him that you have i say not will have or may have but have now in actual possession it is thus that we obtain promises by faith it is thus that we have access by faith into the grace that is given us in our lord jesus christ it is thus and thus only that we come to know our hearts purified by faith and are enabled to live by faith to stand by faith to walk by faith i desire to make this subject so plain and practical that no one need have any further difficulty about it and therefore i will repeat again just what must be the acts of your soul in order to bring you out of this difficulty about consecration i suppose that you have trusted the lord jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and know something of what it is to belong to the family of god and to be made an heir of god through faith in christ and now you feel springing up in your heart the longing to be conformed to the image of your lord in order for this you know there must be an entire surrender of yourself to him that he may work in you all the good pleasure of his will and you have tried over and over to do it but hitherto without any apparent success at this point it is that i desire to help you what you must do now is to come once more to him in a surrender of your whole self to his will as complete as you know how to make it you must ask him to reveal to you by his spirit any hidden rebellion and if he reveals nothing then you must believe that there is nothing and that the surrender is complete this must then be considered a settled matter you have wholly yielded yourself to the lord and from henceforth you do not in any sense belong to yourself you must never even so much as listen to a suggestion to the contrary if the temptation comes to wonder whether you really have completely surrendered yourself meet it with an assertion that you have do not even argue the matter repel any such idea instantly and with decision you meant it then you mean it now you have really done it your emotions may clamor against surrender but your will must hold firm it is your purpose god looks at not your feelings about that purpose and your purpose or will is therefore the only thing you need to attend to the surrender then having been made never to be questioned or recalled the next point is to believe that god takes that which you have surrendered and to reckon that it is his not that it will be his at some future time but that it is now and that he has begun to work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure and here you must rest there is nothing more for you to do except to be henceforth an obedient child for you are the lord's now absolutely and entirely in his hands and he has undertaken the whole care and management and forming of you and will according to his word work in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ but you must hold steadily here if you begin to question your surrender or god's acceptance of it then your wavering faith will produce a wavering experience 
and he cannot work in you to do his will. But while you trust, he works, and the result of his working always is to change you into the image of Christ, from glory to glory, by his mighty Spirit. Do you then, now at this moment, surrender yourself wholly to him? You answer yes. Then, my dear friend, begin at once to reckon that you are his, that he has taken you, and that he is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And keep on reckoning this. You will find it a great help to put your reckoning into words and say over and over to yourself and to God, Lord, I am thine. I do yield myself entirely to thee, and I believe that thou dost take me. I leave myself with thee. Work in me all the good pleasure of thy will, and I will only lie still in thy hands and trust thee. Make this a daily, definite act of your will, and many times a day recur to it as being your continual attitude before the Lord. Confess it to yourself. Confess it to your God. Confess it to your friends. Avouch the Lord to be your God continually and unwaveringly, and declare your purpose of walking in his ways and keeping his statutes. And sooner or later you will find in practical experience that he has avouched you to be one of his peculiar people and will enable you to keep all his commandments and that you are being made into an holy people unto the Lord as he has spoken. For thou art making me, I thank thee, sire, what thou hast done and doest, thou knowest well. And I will help thee, gently in thy fire, I will lie burning. On thy potter's wheel, I will whirl patient, though my brain should reel. Thy grace shall be enough, my grief to quell, and growing strength perfect through weakness dire. End of chapter 5 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 6 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 6 Difficulties Concerning Faith. The next step after consecration in the soul's progress out of the wilderness of a failing Christian experience into the land that floweth with milk and honey is that of faith. And here, as in the first step, the soul encounters at once certain forms of difficulty and hindrance. The child of God, whose eyes have been opened to see the fullness there is in Jesus for him, and whose heart has been made hungry to appropriate that fullness, is met with the assertion on the part of every teacher to whom he applies, that this fullness is only to be received by faith. But the subject of faith is involved in such a hopeless mystery to his mind, that this assertion, instead of throwing light upon the way of entrance, only seems to make it more difficult and involved than ever. Of course it is to be by faith, he says, for I know that everything in the Christian life is by faith, but that is just what makes it so hard, for I have no faith, and I do not even know what it is or how to get it. And thus, baffled at the very outset by this insuperable difficulty, he is plunged into darkness and almost despair. This trouble arises from the fact that the subject of faith is very generally misunderstood, for, in reality, faith is the simplest and plainest thing in the world, and the most easy of exercise. Your idea of faith, I suppose, has been something like this. You have looked upon it as, in some way, a sort of thing, either a religious exercise of soul, or an inward gracious disposition of heart, something tangible, in fact, which, when you have secured it, you can look at and rejoice over, and use as a passport to God's favor, or a coin with which to purchase his gifts. 
and you have been praying for faith, expecting all the while to get something like this, and never having received any such thing, you are insisting upon it that you have no faith. Now faith, in fact, is not in the least like this. It is nothing at all tangible. It is simply believing God, and, like sight, it is nothing apart from its object. You might as well shut your eyes and look inside, and see whether you have sight, as to look inside to discover whether you have faith. You see something, and thus know that you have sight. You believe something, and thus know that you have faith. For as sight is only seeing, so faith is only believing. And as the only necessary thing about sight is that you see the thing as it is, so the only necessary thing about belief is that you believe the thing as it is. The virtue does not lie in your believing, but in the thing you believe. If you believe the truth, you are saved. If you believe a lie, you are lost. The act of believing in both cases is the same. The things believed are exactly opposite, and this it is which makes the mighty difference. Your salvation comes not because your faith saves you, but because it links you to the Savior who saves and your believing is really nothing but the link. I do beg of you to recognize, then, the extreme simplicity of faith, namely, that it is nothing more nor less than just believing God when he says he either has done something for us or will do it, and then trusting him to keep his word. It is so simple that it is hard to explain. If anyone asks me what it means to trust another to do a piece of work for me, I can only answer that it means committing the work to that other and leaving it without anxiety in his hands. All of us have many times trusted very important affairs to others in this way and have felt perfect rest in thus trusting because of the confidence we have had in those who have undertaken them. How constantly do mothers trust their most precious infants to the care of nurses and feel no shadow of anxiety? How continually we are all of us trusting our health and our lives, without a thought of fear, to cooks and coachmen, engine drivers, railway conductors, and all sorts of paid servants, who have us completely at their mercy, and who could, if they chose to do so, or even if they failed in the necessary carefulness, plunge us into misery or death in a moment. All this we do, and make no demur about it. Upon the slightest acquaintance, often we thus put our trust in people, requiring only the general knowledge of human nature and the common rules of human intercourse as the foundation of our trust, and we never feel as if we were doing anything in the least remarkable. You have done this yourself, dear reader, and are doing it continually. You could not live among your fellow men and go through the customary routine of life a single day if you are unable to trust your fellow men, and it never enters your head to say you cannot. But yet, you do not hesitate to say continually that you cannot trust your God, and you excuse yourself by the plea that you are a poor, weak creature and have no faith. I wish you would try to imagine yourself acting in your human relations as you do in your spiritual relations. Suppose you should begin tomorrow with the notion in your head that you could not trust anybody because you had no faith. When you sat down to breakfast, you would say, I cannot eat anything on this table, for I have no faith, and I cannot believe the cook has not put poison in the coffee, or that the butcher has not sent home diseased or unhealthy meat. So you would go starving away. When you went out to your daily avocations, you would say, I cannot ride in the railway train, for I have no faith, and therefore I cannot trust the engineer, nor the conductor, nor the builders of the carriages, nor the managers of the road. And you would be compelled to walk everywhere, and would grow unutterably weary in the effort, besides being actually unable to reach the places you could have reached in the train. When your friends met with you with any statements, or your business agent with any accounts, you would say, I am very sorry that I cannot believe you, but I have no faith and never can believe anybody. If you opened a newspaper, you would be forced to lay it down again, saying, I really cannot believe a word this paper says, for I have no faith. 
I do not believe there is any such person as the Queen, for I never saw her, nor any such country as Ireland, for I was never there. I have no faith, so of course I cannot believe anything that I have not actually felt and touched myself. It is a great trial, but I cannot help it, for I have no faith. Just picture such a day as this, and see how disastrous it would be to yourself, and what utter folly it would appear to any one who should watch you through the whole of it. Realize how your friends would feel insulted, and how your servants would refuse to serve you another day. And then ask yourself the question, if this want of faith in your fellow men would be so dreadful, and such utter folly, what must it be when you tell God that you have no power to trust Him, nor to believe His word, that it is a great trial, but you cannot help it, for you have no faith? Is it possible that you can trust your fellow men, and cannot trust your God, that you can receive the witness of men, and cannot receive the witness of God, that you can believe man's records, and cannot believe God's record? that you can commit your dearest earthly interests to your weak, failing fellow creatures without a fear, and are afraid to commit your spiritual interests to the Savior who laid down his life for you, and of whom it is declared that he is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. Surely, surely, dear believer, you whose very name of believer implies that you can believe, you will never again dare to excuse yourself on the plea of having no faith. For when you say this, you mean, of course, that you have no faith in God, since you are not asked to have faith in yourself, and would be in a very wrong condition of soul if you had. Let me beg of you, then, when you think or say these things, always to complete the sentence and say, I have no faith in God. I cannot believe God. And this, I am sure, will soon become so dreadful to you that you will not dare to continue it. But, you say, I cannot believe without the Holy Spirit. Very well. Will you conclude, then, that your want of faith is because of the failure of the Holy Spirit to do his work? For if it is, then surely you are not to blame, and need feel no condemnation, and all exhortations to you to believe are useless. But no, do you not see that in taking up the position that you have no faith and cannot believe, you are not only making God a liar, but you are also showing an utter want of confidence in the Holy Spirit, for he is always ready to help our infirmities. We never have to wait for him. He is always waiting for us. And I, for my part, have such absolute confidence in the Holy Ghost, and in his being always ready to do his work, that I dare to say to every one of you that you can believe now, at this very moment, and that if you do not, it is not the Spirit's fault, but your own. Put your will, then, over on the believing side. Say, Lord, I will believe, I do believe, and continue to say it. Insist upon believing in the face of every suggestion of doubt that intrudes itself. Out of your very unbelief, throw yourself unreservedly on the word and promises of God, and dare to abandon yourself to the keeping and saving power of the Lord Jesus. If you have ever trusted a precious interest in the hands of an earthly friend, I entreat you, trust yourself and all your spiritual interests now in the hands of your heavenly friend, and never, never, never allow yourself to doubt again. Remember always that there are two things which are more utterly incompatible even than oil and water, and these two are trust and worry. Would you call it trust if you should give something into the hands of a friend to attend to for you, and then should spend your nights and days in anxious thought and worry as to whether it would be rightly and successfully done? And can you call it trust when you have given the saving and keeping of your soul into the hands of the Lord, if day after day and night after night, you are spending hours of anxious thought and questionings about the matter? When a believer really trusts anything, he ceases to worry about the thing he has trusted. And when he worries, it is a plain proof that he does not trust. Tested by this rule, how little real trust there is in the Church of Christ. No wonder our Lord asked the pathetic question, 
when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth he will find plenty of work a great deal of earnestness and doubtless many consecrated hearts but shall he find faith the one thing he values more than all the rest every child of god in his own case will know how to answer this question should the answer for any of you be a sorrowful no let me entreat you to let this be the last time for such an answer and if you have ever known anything of the trustworthiness of our lord may you henceforth set to your seal that he is true by the generous recklessness of your trust in him i remember very early in my christian life having every tender and loyal impulse within me stirred to the depths of an appeal i met with in a volume of old sermons to all who love the lord jesus that they should show to others how worthy he was of being trusted by the steadfastness of their own faith in him as i read the inspiring words there came to me a sudden glimpse of the privilege and glory of being called to walk in paths so dark that only an utter recklessness of trust would be possible ye have not passed this way heretofore it may be but to-day it is your happy privilege to prove as never before your loyal confidence in jesus by starting out with him on a life and walk of faith lived moment by moment in absolute and childlike trust in him you have trusted him in a few things and he has not failed you trust him now for everything and see if he does not do for you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever have asked or even thought not according to your power or capacity but according to his own mighty power working in you all the good pleasure of his most blessed will it is not hard you find to trust the management of the universe and of all the outward creation to the lord can your case then be so much more complex and difficult than these that you need to be anxious or troubled about his management of you away with such unworthy doubtings take your stand on the power and trustworthiness of your god and see how quickly all difficulties will vanish before a steadfast determination to believe trust in the dark trust in the light trust at night and trust in the morning and you will find that the faith that may begin perhaps by a mighty effort will end sooner or later by becoming the easy and natural habit of the soul it is a law of the spiritual life that every act of trust makes the next act less difficult until at length if these acts are persisted in trusting becomes like breathing the natural unconscious action of the redeemed soul you must therefore put your will into your believing your faith must not be a passive imbecility but an active energy you may have to believe against every seeming but no matter set your face like a flint to say i will believe and i know i shall not be confounded we are made partakers of christ if we hold the beginning of our faith steadfast unto the end hundreds fail just here they have a little beginning of faith but discouragements come the seemings are all against it their doubts clamor louder and louder and at last they let them in and when doubt comes in at the door trust always flies out of the window we are told that all things are possible to god and that all things are possible also to him that believeth faith has in times past subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness obtained promises stopped the mouths of lions quenched the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword waxed valiant in fight turned to flight the armies of the aliens and faith can do it again for our lord himself says unto us if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed ye shall say unto this mountain remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you if you are a child of god at all you must have at least as much faith as a grain of mustard seed and therefore you dare not say again that you cannot trust because you have no faith say rather i can trust my lord and i will trust him 
and not all the powers of earth or hell shall be able to make me doubt my wonderful, glorious, faithful Redeemer. Faith is sweetest of worships to him who so loves, his unbearable splendors in darkness to hide, and to trust to thy word, dearest Lord, is true love, for those prayers are most granted which seem most denied. Our faith throws her arms around all thou hast told her, and able to hold as much more can but grieve. She could hold thy grand self, Lord, if thou wouldst reveal it, and love makes her long to have more to believe. Let your faith, then, throw its arms around all God has told you, and in every dark hour remember that, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, it is only like going through a tunnel. The sun has not ceased shining because a traveler through the tunnel has ceased to see it, and the sun of righteousness is still shining, although you in your dark tunnel do not see him. Be patient and trustful, and wait. This time of darkness is only permitted that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. End of chapter 6 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 7 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitall Smith Chapter 7 Difficulties Concerning the Will when the child of God has, by entire abandonment and absolute trust, stepped out of himself into Christ, and has begun to know something of the blessedness of the life hid with Christ in God, there is one form of difficulty which is especially likely to start up in his path. After the first emotions of peace and rest have somewhat subsided, or if, as is sometimes the case, they have never seemed to come at all, he begins to feel such an utter unreality in the things he has been passing through that he seems to himself like a hypocrite when he says or even thinks they are real. It seems to him that his belief does not go below the surface, that it is a mere lip belief and therefore of no account, and that his surrender is not a surrender of the heart and therefore cannot be acceptable to God. He is afraid to say he is altogether the Lord's, for fear he will be telling an untruth. And yet he cannot bring himself to say he is not, because he longs for it so intensely. The difficulty is real, and very disheartening. But there is nothing new here which will not be very easily overcome when the Christian once thoroughly understands the principles of the new life and has learned how to live in it. The common thought is that this life hid with Christ and God is to be lived in the emotions, and consequently all the attention of the soul is directed toward them, and as they are satisfactory or otherwise, the soul rests or is troubled. Now the truth is that this life is not to be lived in the emotions at all, but in the will, and therefore if only the will is kept steadfastly abiding in its center, God's will the varying states of emotion do not in the least disturb or affect the reality of the life. To make this plain, I must enlarge a little. Finland says somewhere that pure religion resides in the will alone. By this he means that, as the will is the governing power in the man's nature, if the will is set right, all the rest of the nature must come into harmony. By the will I do not mean the wish of the man, or even his purpose, but the deliberate choice, the deciding power, the king, to which all that is in the man must yield obedience. It is the man, in short, the ego, 
that which we feel to be ourselves. It is sometimes thought that the emotions are the governing power in our nature, but I think we all of us know, as a matter of practical experience, that there is something within us, behind our emotions and behind our wishes, an independent self that, after all, decides everything and controls everything. Our emotions belong to us, and are suffered and enjoyed by us, but they are not ourselves, and if God is to take possession of us, it must be into this sensual will or personality that he enters. If, then, he is reigning there by the power of his spirit, all the rest of our nature must come under his sway, and as the will is, so is the man. The practical bearing of this truth upon the difficulty I am considering is very great, for the decisions of our will are often so directly opposed to the decisions of our emotions that, if we are in the habit of considering our emotions as the test, we shall be very apt to feel like hypocrites in declaring those things to be real which our will alone has decided. But the moment we see that the will is king, we shall utterly disregard anything that clamors against it, and shall claim as real its decisions, let the emotions rebel as they may. I am aware that this is a difficult subject to deal with, but it is so exceedingly practical in its bearing upon the life of faith that I beg of you, dear reader, not to turn from it until you have mastered it. Perhaps an illustration will help you. A young man of great intelligence, seeking to enter into this new life, was utterly discouraged at finding himself the slave to an inveterate habit of doubting. To his emotions nothing seemed true, nothing seemed real, and the more he struggled, the more unreal did it all become. He was told this secret concerning the will, that if he would only put his will over on the believing side, if he would choose to believe, if, in short, he would in this ego of his nature say, I will believe, I do believe, he need not then trouble about his emotions, for they would find themselves compelled sooner or later to come into harmony. What? he said. Do you mean to tell me that I can choose to believe in that bald way when nothing seems true to me? And will that kind of believing be real? Yes, was the answer, it will. Fiddlin says that the true religion resides in the will alone. And he means that, since a man's will is really the man's self, of course, what his will does, he does. Your part, then, is simply to put your will in this matter of believing over on God's side, making up your mind that you will believe what he says because he says it, and that you will not pay any regard to the feelings that make it seem so unreal. God will not fail to respond, sooner or later, with his revelation to such a faith. The young man paused a moment, and then said solemnly, I understand, and will do what you say. I cannot control my emotions, but I can control my will and the new life begins to look possible to me if it is only my will that needs to be set straight in the matter. I can give my will to God, and I do. From that moment, disregarding all the pitiful clamoring of his emotions, which continually accused him of being a wretched hypocrite, this young man held on steadily to the decision of his will, answering every accusation with the continued assertion that he chose to believe. He meant to believe, he did believe, until at the end of a few days he found himself triumphant with every emotion and every thought brought into captivity to the power of the Spirit of God who had taken possession of the will thus put into his hands. He had held fast the profession of his faith without wavering, although it had seemed to him that, as to real faith itself, he had none to hold fast. At times it drained all the willpower he possessed to his lips to say that he believed, so contrary was it to all the evidence of his senses or of his emotions. But he had caught the idea that his will was, after all, himself, and that if he kept that on God's side, he was doing all he could do, and that God alone would change his emotions or control his being. 
the results have been one of the grandest christian lives i know of in its marvelous simplicity directness and power over sin the secret lies just here that our will which is the spring of all our actions has been in the past under the control of sin and self and these have worked in us all their own good pleasure but now god calls upon us to yield our wills up to him that he may take the control of them and may work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure if we will obey this call and present ourselves to him as a living sacrifice he will take possession of our surrendered wills and will begin at once to work in us that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ giving us the mind that was in christ and transforming us into his image see romans twelve one and two let us take another illustration a lady who had entered into this life hid with christ was confronted by a great perspective trial every emotion she had within her rose up in rebellion against it and had she considered her emotions to be her king she would have been in utter despair but she had learned this secret of the will and knowing that at the bottom she herself did really choose the will of god for her portion she did not pay the slightest attention to her emotions but persisted in meeting every thought concerning the trial with the words repeated over and over thy will be done thy will be done asserting in the face of all her rebelling feelings that she did submit her will to god's that she chose to submit it and that his will should be and was her delight the result was that in an incredibly short space of time every thought was brought into captivity and she began to find even her very emotions rejoicing in the will of god again there was a lady who had a besetting sin which in her emotions she dearly loved but which in her will she hated believing herself to be necessarily under the control of her emotions she had fully supposed she was unable to conquer it unless her emotions should first be changed but she learned this secret concerning the will and going to her closet she said lord thou seest that with my emotions i love this sin but in my real central self i hate it until now my emotions have had the mastery but now i put my will into thy hands and give it up to thy working i will never again consent in my will to yield to this sin take possession of my will and work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure immediately she began to find deliverance the lord took possession of the will thus surrendered to himself and began to work in her by his own power so that his will in the matter gained the mastery over her emotions and she found herself delivered not by the power of an outward commandment but by the inward power of the spirit of god working in her that which was well pleasing in his sight and now dear christian let me show you how to apply this principle to your difficulties cease to consider your emotions for they are only the servants and regard simply your will which is the real king in your being is that given up to god is that put into his hands does your will decide to believe does your will choose to obey if this is the case then you are in the lord's hands and you decide to believe and you choose to obey for your will is yourself and the thing is done the transaction with god is as real when only your will acts as where every emotion coincides it does not seem as real to you but in god's sight it is real and when you have got hold of this secret and have discovered that you need not attend to your emotions but simply to the state of your will all the scripture commands to yield yourself to god to present yourself a living sacrifice to him to abide in christ to walk in the light to die to self become possible to you for you are conscious that in all these your will can act and can take god's side whereas if it had been your emotions that must do it you would knowing them to be utterly uncontrollable sink down in helpless despair when then 
this feeling of unreality or hypocrisy comes do not be troubled by it it is only in your emotions and is not worth a moment's thought only see to it that your will is in god's hands that your inward self is abandoned to his working that your choice your decision is on his side and there leave it your surging emotions like a tossing vessel at anchor which by degrees yields to the steady pull of the cable finding themselves attached to the mighty power of god by the choice of your will must inevitably come into captivity and give in their allegiance to him and you will sooner or later verify the truth of the saying that if any man will do his will he shall know of the doctrine the will is like a wise mother in a nursery the feelings are like a set of clamoring crying children the mother makes up her mind to a certain course of action which she believes to be right and best the children clamor against it and declare it shall not be but the mother knowing that she is mistress and not they pursues her course lovingly and calmly in spite of all their clamors and the result is that the children are sooner or later won over to the mother's course of action and fall in with her decisions and all is harmonious and happy but if that mother should for a moment let in the thought that the children were the masters instead of herself confusion would reign unchecked and in how many souls at this very moment is there nothing but confusion simply because the feelings are allowed to govern instead of the will remember then that the real thing in your experience is what your will decides and not the verdict of your emotions and that you are far more in danger of hypocrisy and untruth in yielding to the assertions of your feelings than in holding fast to the decision of your will so that if your will is on god's side you are no hypocrite at this moment in claiming as your own the blessed reality of belonging altogether to him even though your emotions may all declare the contrary i am convinced that throughout the bible the expressions concerning the heart do not mean the emotions that which we now understand by the word heart but they mean the will the personality of the man the man's own central self and that the object of god's dealings with man is that this i may be yielded up to him and this central life abandoned to his entire control it is not the feelings of the man god wants but the man himself but do not let us make a mistake here i say we must give up our wills but i do not mean we are to be left willless we are not so to give up our wills as to be left like limp nerveless creatures without any will at all we are simply to substitute for our foolish misdirected wills of ignorance and immaturity the higher divine mature will of god if we lay the emphasis on the word our we shall understand it better the will we are to give up is our will as it is misdirected and so parted off from god's will not our will when it is one with god's will for when our will is in harmony with his will when it has the stamp of oneness with him it would be wrong for us to give it up the child is required to give up the misdirected will that belongs to it as a child and we cannot let it say i will or i will not but when its will is in harmony with ours we want it to say i will or i will not with all the force of which it is capable when god is working in us to will we must set our faces like a flint to carry out this will and must respond with an emphatic i will to every thou shalt of his for god can only carry out his own will with us as we consent to it and will in harmony with him have you thus consented dear reader and is your face set as a flint to will what god wills he wills that you should be entirely surrendered to him and that you should trust him perfectly do you will the same again i repeat it is all in the will fenelon says the will to love god is the whole of religion if therefore you have in your will taken the steps of surrender and faith it is your right to believe even now 
no matter how much your feelings may clamor against it, that you are all the Lord's, and that he has begun to work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. After this chapter was first written some years ago, the following remarkable practical illustration of its teaching was handed to me by Pasteur Theodore Monod of Paris. It is the experience of a Presbyterian minister which this Pasteur had carefully kept for many years. Newburgh, September 26, 1842 Dear Brother, I take a few moments of that time which I have devoted to the Lord in writing a short epistle to you, his servant. It is sweet to feel we are wholly the Lord's, that he has received us and called us his. This is religion, a relinquishment of the principle of self-ownership and the adoption and full of the abiding sentiment, I am not my own, I am bought with a price. Since I last saw you, I have been pressing forward and yet there has been nothing remarkable in my experience of which I can speak. Indeed, I do not know that it is best to look for remarkable things, but strive to be holy as God is holy, pressing right on toward the mark of the prize. I do not feel myself qualified to instruct you. I can only tell you the way in which I was led. The Lord deals differently with different souls, and we ought not to attempt to copy the experience of others. Yet there are certain things which must be attended to by everyone who is seeking after a clean heart. There must be a personal consecration of all to God, a covenant made with God that we will be holy and forever His. This I made intellectually, without any change in my feelings, with a heart full of hardness and darkness, unbelief in sin, and insensibility. I covenanted to be the Lord's, and laid all upon the altar, a living sacrifice to the best of my ability. And after I rose from my knees, I was conscious of no change in my feelings. I was painfully conscious that there was no change. But yet I was sure that I did, with all the sincerity and honesty of purpose of which I was capable, make an entire and eternal consecration of myself to God. I did not then consider the work as done by any means, but I engaged to abide in a state of entire devotion to God, a living perpetual sacrifice. And now came the effort to do this. I knew also that I must believe that God did accept me and did come to dwell in my heart. I was conscious I did not believe this, and yet I desired to do so. I read with much prayer John's first epistle and endeavored to assure my heart of God's love to me as an individual. I was sensible that my heart was full of evil. I seemed to have no power to overcome pride or to repel evil thoughts which I abhorred. But Christ was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, and it was clear that the sin in my heart was the work of the devil. I was enabled, therefore, to believe that God was working in me to will and to do, while I was working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. I was convinced of unbelief that it made the faithful God a liar. The Lord brought me before my besetting sins, which had dominion over me, especially preaching myself instead of Christ, and indulging in self-complacent thoughts after preaching. I was enabled to make myself of no reputation, and to seek the honor which cometh from God only. Satan struggled hard to beat me back from the rock of ages, but thanks to God I finally hit upon the method of living by the moment, and then I found rest. I felt shut up to a momentary dependence upon the grace of Christ. I would not permit the adversary to trouble me about the past or future, for I each moment looked for the supply for that moment. I agreed that I would be a child of Abraham, and walk by naked faith in the word of God, and not by inward feelings and emotions. I would seek to be a Bible Christian. Since that time the Lord has given me a steady victory over sins which before enslaved me. I delight in the Lord and in His Word. I delight in my work as a minister. My fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I am a babe in Christ. 
I know my progress has been small compared with that made by many. My feelings vary, but when I have feelings I praise God and trust in His word, and when I am empty and my feelings are gone, I do the same. I have covenanted to walk by faith and not by feelings. The Lord, I think, is beginning to revive His work among my people. Praise the Lord! May the Lord fill you with all His fullness and give you all the mind of Christ. O oh, be faithful! Walk before God and be perfect. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. The Lord loves you. He works with you. Rest your soul fully upon that promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Your fellow soldier, William Hill End of chapter 7 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 8 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 8 Difficulties Concerning Guidance. You have now begun, dear reader, the life of faith. You have given yourself to the Lord to be His holy and altogether, and you are now entirely in His hands to be molded and fashioned, according to His own divine purpose, into a vessel unto His honor. Your one most earnest desire is to follow Him whithersoever He may lead you, and to be very pliable in His hands, and you are trusting Him to work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. But you find a great difficulty here. You have not learned yet to know the voice of the Good Shepherd, and are therefore in great doubt and perplexity as to what really is his will concerning you. Perhaps there are certain paths into which God seems to be calling you, of which your friends disapprove. And these friends, it may be, are older than yourself in the Christian life, and seem to you also to be much farther advanced. You can scarcely bear to differ from them or to distress them, and you feel also very diffident of yielding to any seeming impressions of duty of which they do not approve. And yet you cannot get rid of these impressions, and you find yourself therefore plunged into great doubt and uneasiness. There is a way out of all of these difficulties to the fully surrendered soul. I would repeat, fully surrendered, because if there is any reserve of will upon any point, it becomes almost impossible to find out the mind of God in reference to that point, and therefore the first thing is to be sure that you really do purpose to obey the Lord in every respect. If, however, this is your purpose, and your soul only needs to know the will of God in order to consent to it, then you surely cannot doubt his willingness to make his will known and to guide you in the right paths. There are many very clear promises in reference to this. Take, for instance, John 10, 3 and 4. He calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Or John 14.26 But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Or James 1, five and 6 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. With such declarations as these, and many more like them, we must believe that divine guidance is promised to us, and our faith must therefore confidently look for and expect it. This is essential, for in James 1, 6, and 7 we are told, Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. 
settle this point then first of all and let no suggestion of doubt turn you from a steadfast faith in regard to it that divine guidance has been promised and that if you seek it you are sure to receive it next you must remember that our god has all knowledge and all wisdom and that therefore it is very possible he may guide you into paths wherein he knows great blessings are awaiting you but which to the short-sighted human eyes around you seem sure to result in confusion and loss you must recognize the fact that god's thoughts are not as man's thoughts nor his ways as man's ways and that he alone who knows the end of things from the beginning can judge of what the results of any course of action may be you must therefore realize that his very love for you may perhaps lead you to run counter to the loving wishes of even your dearest friends you must learn from luke fourteen twenty six through thirty three and similar passages that in order to be a disciple and follower of your lord you may perhaps be called upon to forsake inwardly all that you have even father or mother or brother or sister or husband or wife or it may be your own life also unless the possibility of this is clearly recognized you will be very likely to get into difficulty because it often happens that the child of god who enters upon this life of obedience is sooner or later led into paths which meet with the disapproval of those he best loves and unless he is prepared for all this and can trust the lord through it all he will scarcely know what to do but these points having all been settled we come now to the question as to how god's guidance is to come to us and how we shall be able to know his voice there are four ways in which he reveals his will to us through the scriptures through providential circumstances through the convictions of our own higher judgment and through the inward impression of the holy spirit on our minds where these four harmonize it is safe to say that god speaks for i lay it down as a foundation principle which no one can gainsay that of course his voice will always be in harmony with itself no matter in how many different ways he may speak the voices may be many the message can be but one if god tells me in one voice to do or leave undone anything he cannot possibly tell me the opposite in another voice if there is a contradiction in the voices the speakers cannot be the same therefore my rule for distinguishing the voice of god would be to bring it to the test of this harmony the scriptures come first if you are in doubt upon any subject you must first of all consult the bible about it and see whether there is any law there to direct you until you have found and obeyed god's will as it is there revealed you must not ask nor expect a separate direct personal revelation a great many fatal mistakes are made in the matter of guidance by the overlooking of this simple rule where our father has written out for us a plain direction about anything he will not of course make an especial revelation to us about that thing and if we fail to search out and obey the scripture rule where there is one and look instead for an inward voice we shall open ourselves to delusions and shall almost inevitably get into error no man for instance needs or could expect any direct personal revelation to tell him not to steal because god has already in the scriptures plainly declared his will about stealing this seems such an obvious thing that i would not speak of it but i have frequently met with christians who have altogether overlooked it and who have as the result gone off into fanaticism i knew one earnest christian who had the text all things are yours so strongly impressed upon her mind in reference to some money belonging to a friend that she felt it was a direct command to her to steal that money and after a great struggle she obeyed this apparent guidance with of course most grievous after results had she submitted her leading to the plain teaching of scripture in reference to stealing she would have been saved the bible it is true does not always give a rule for every particular course of action and in these cases we need and must expect guidance in other ways but the scriptures are far more explicit even about details than most people think 
and there are not many important affairs in life for which a clear direction may not be found in God's book. Take the matter of dress, and we have 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, and 1 Timothy 2, 9. Take the matter of conversation, and we have Ephesians 4, 29 and 5, 4. Take the matter of avenging injuries and standing up for our rights, and we have Romans 12, 19 through 21, and Matthew 5, 38 through 48, and 1 Peter 2, 19 through 21. Take the matter of forgiving one another, and we have Ephesians 4, 32, and Mark 11, 25 and 26. Take the matter of conformity to the world, and we have Romans 12, 2, and 1 John 2, 15 to 17, and James 4, 4. Take the matter of anxieties of every kind, and we have Matthew 6, 25 through 34, and Philippians 4, 6 and 7. I only give you these examples to show how very full and practical the Bible guidance is. If, therefore, you find yourself in perplexity, first of all search and see whether the Bible speaks on the point in question, asking God to make plain to you by the power of His Spirit through the Scriptures what is His mind. And whatever shall seem to you to be plainly taught there, that you must obey. No especial guidance will ever be given about a point on which the Scriptures are explicit, nor could any guidance ever be contrary to the Scriptures. It is essential, however, in this connection to remember that the Bible is a book of principles and not a book of disjointed aphorisms. Isolated texts may often be made to sanction things to which the principles of Scripture are totally opposed. I believe all fanaticism comes in this way. An isolated text is so impressed upon the mind that it seems a necessity to obey it, no matter into what wrong thing it may lead, and thus the principles of scriptures are violated under the very plea of obedience to the scriptures. In Luke 4, the enemy is represented as using isolated texts to endorse his temptations, while Christ repelled him by announcing principles. If, however, upon searching the Bible you do not find any principles that will settle your especial point of difficulty, you must then seek guidance in the other ways mentioned, and God will surely voice himself to you, either by a conviction of your judgment, or by providential circumstances, or by a clear inward impression. In all true guidance these four voices will, as I have said, necessarily harmonize, for God cannot say in one voice that which he contradicts in another. Therefore, if you have an impression of duty, you must see whether it is in accordance with scriptures, and whether it commends itself to your own higher judgment, and also whether, as we Quakers say, the way opens for its carrying out. If any one of these tests fails, it is not safe to proceed, but you must wait in quiet trust until the Lord shows you the point of harmony, which he surely will sooner or later, if it is his voice that is speaking. Anything which is out of this divine harmony must be rejected, therefore, as not coming from God. For we must never forget that impressions can come from other sources as well as from the Holy Spirit. The strong personalities of those around us are the source of a great many of our impressions. Impressions also arise from our wrong physical conditions, which color things far more than we dream. And finally, impressions come from those spiritual enemies which seem to lie in wait for every traveler who seeks to enter the higher regions of the spiritual life. In the same epistle which tells us that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 2, 6, we are also told that we shall have to fight there with spiritual enemies, Ephesians 6, 12. These spiritual enemies, whoever or whatever they may be, must necessarily communicate with us by means of our spiritual faculties, and their voices therefore will be, as the voice of God is, an inward impression made upon our spirits. Consequently, just as the Holy Spirit may tell us by impressions what is the will of God concerning us, so also will these spiritual enemies tell us by impressions what is their will concerning us, 
disguising themselves, of course, as angels of light, who have come to lead us closer to God. Many earnest and honest-hearted children of God have thus been deluded into paths of extreme fanaticism, while all the while thinking they were closely following the Lord. God, who sees the sincerity of their hearts, can, and does, I am sure, pity and forgive, but the consequences as to this life are often very sad. It is not enough to have a leading. We must find out the source of that leading before we give ourselves up to follow it. It is not enough, either, for the leading to be very remarkable, or the coincidences to be very striking, to stamp it as being surely from God. In all ages of the world, evil and deceiving agencies have been able to work miracles, foretell events, reveal secrets, and give signs, and God's people have always been emphatically warned about being deceived thereby. It is essential, therefore, that our leadings should all be tested by the teachings of Scripture, but this alone is not enough. They must be tested as well by our own spiritually enlightened judgment, or what is familiarly called common sense. So far as I can see, the Scriptures everywhere make it an essential thing for the children of God in their journey through this world to use all the faculties that have been given them. They are to use their outward faculties for their outward walk, and their inward faculties for their inward walk, and they might as well expect to be kept from dashing their feet against a stone in the outward if they walk blindfolded, as to be kept from spiritual stumbling if they put aside their judgment and common sense in their interior life. Some, however, may say here, but I thought we were not to depend on our human understanding in divine things. I answer to this that we are not to depend on our unenlightened human understanding, but upon our human judgment and common sense enlightened by the Spirit of God. That is, God will speak to us through the faculties He has Himself given us, and not independently of them, so that just as we are to use our outward eyes in our outward walk, no matter how full of faith we may be, so also we are to use the interior eyes of our understanding in our interior walk with God. The third test to which our impressions must be brought is that of providential circumstances. If a leading is of God, the way will always open for it. Our Lord assures us of this when he says in John 10:4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Notice here the expressions goeth before and follow. He goes before to open a way, and we are to follow in the way thus open. It is never a sign of a divine leading when the Christian insists on opening his own way and riding roughshod over all opposing things. If the Lord goes before us, he will open the door for us, and we shall not need to batter down doors for ourselves. The fourth point I would make is this, that just as our impressions must be tested, as I have shown by the other three voices, so must these other voices be tested by our inward impressions, and if we feel a stop in our minds about anything, we must wait until that is removed before acting. A Christian who had advanced with unusual rapidity in the divine life gave me, as her secret, the simple receipt. I always mind the checks. We must not ignore the voice of our inward impressions, nor ride roughshod over them any more than we must the other three voices of which I have spoken. Every peculiarly precious spiritual gift is always necessarily linked with some peculiar danger. When the spiritual world is open to a soul, both the good and the evil there will meet it. But we must not be discouraged by this. Who would not rather take manhood with all its risks and dangers than remain forever in the ignorance and innocence of childhood? And who would not rather grow up into the stature of Christ, even if it shall involve new and more subtle forms of temptation? Therefore we must not be deterred from embracing the blessed privilege of divine guidance by a dread of the dangers that environ it. 
with the four tests i have mentioned and a divine sense of oughtness derived from the harmony of all of god's voices there need be nothing to fear and to me it seems that the blessedness and joy of this direct communication of god's will to us is one of our grandest privileges that god cares enough about us to desire to regulate the details of our lives is the strongest proof of love he could give and that he should condescend to tell us all about it and to let us know just how to live and walk so as perfectly to please him seems almost too good to be true we never care about the little details of people's lives unless we love them it is a matter of indifference to us what the majority of people we meet do or how they spend their time but as soon as we begin to love anyone we begin at once to care god's law therefore is only another name for god's love and the more minutely that law descends into the details of our lives the more sure we are made of the depth and reality of the love we can never know the full joy and privileges of the life hid with christ in god until we have learned the lesson of a daily and hourly guidance god's promise is that he will work in us to will as well as to do of his good pleasure this means of course that he will take possession of our will and work it for us and that his suggestions will come to us not so much commands from the outside as desires springing up within they will originate in our will we shall feel as though we desired to do so and so not as though we must and this makes it a service of perfect liberty for it is always easy to do what we desire to do let the accompanying circumstances be as difficult as they may every mother knows that she could secure perfect and easy obedience in her child if she could only get into that child's will and work it for him making him want himself to do the thing she willed he should and this is what our father in the new dispensation does for his children he writes his laws on our hearts and on our minds so that our affection and our understanding embrace them and we are drawn to obey instead of being driven to it the way in which the holy spirit therefore usually works in a fully obedient soul in regard to this direct guidance is to impress upon the mind a wish or desire to do or to leave undone certain things the child of god when engaged in prayer feels perhaps a sudden suggestion made to his inmost consciousness in reference to a certain point of duty i would like to do this or the other he thinks i wish i could at once this matter should be committed to the lord with an instant consent of the will to obey him should the suggestion prove to be really from him and then the tests i have mentioned should be intelligently applied namely as to whether the suggestion is in accordance with the teaching of scripture with a sanctified judgment and with providential circumstances often no distinct consciousness of this process is necessary as our spiritual intelligence can see at a glance the right or wrong of the matter but however it may come when the divine harmony is reached and the divine sense of oughtness settles down on the heart then an immediate obedience is the safest and easiest course the first moment that we clearly see a thing to be right is always the moment when it is easy to do it if we let in the reasoner as the quakers express it the golden opportunity is lost and obedience becomes more and more difficult with every moment's delay the old self-will wakens into life and the energies that should have been occupied with obeying are absorbed instead in the struggle with doubts and reasonings it sometimes happens however that in spite of all our efforts to discover the truth the divine sense of oughtness does not seem to come and our doubts and perplexities continue unenlightened in addition to this our friends differ from us and would we know oppose our course in such a case there is nothing to do but to wait until the light comes but we must wait in faith and in an attitude of entire surrender saying a continual yes to the will of our lord let it be what it may if the suggestion is from him it will continue and strengthen if it is not from him 
it will disappear and we shall almost forget we ever had it if it continues if every time we are brought into near communion with the lord it seems to return if it troubles us in our moments of prayer and disturbs all our peace and if finally it conforms to the test of the divine harmony of which i have spoken we may then feel sure it is from god and we must yield to it or suffer an unspeakable loss the apostle gives us a rule in reference to doubtful things which seems to me very explicit he is speaking about certain kinds of meat-eating which were ceremonially unclean and after declaring his own liberty says i know and am persuaded by the lord jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him it is unclean and in summing up the whole subject he writes hast thou faith have it to thyself before god happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth and he that doubteth is damned condemned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin in all doubtful things you must stand still and refrain from action until god gives you light to know more clearly his mind concerning them very often you will find that the doubt has been his voice calling upon you to come into more perfect conformity to his will but sometimes these doubtful things are only temptations or morbid feelings to which it would be most unwise for you to yield and the only way is to wait until you can act in faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin take all your present perplexities then to the lord tell him you only want to know and obey his voice and ask him to make it plain to you promise him that you will obey whatever it may be believe implicitly that he is guiding you according to his word in all doubtful things wait for clear light look and listen for his voice continually and the moment you are sure of it then but not until then yield an immediate obedience trust him to make you forget the impression if it is not his will and if it continues and is in harmony with all his other voices do not be afraid to obey above everything else trust him nowhere is faith more needed than here he has promised to guide you have asked him to do it and now you must believe that he does and must take what comes as being his guidance no earthly parent or master could guide his children or servants if they should refuse to take his commands as being really the expression of his will and god cannot guide those souls who never trust him enough to believe that he is doing it above all do not be afraid of this blessed life lived hour by hour and day by day under the guidance of thy lord if he seeks to bring thee out of the world and into very close conformity to himself do not shrink from it it is thy most blessed privilege rejoice in it embrace it eagerly let everything go that it may be thine god only is the creature's home though rough and straight the road yet nothing else can satisfy the love that longs for god how little of that road my soul how little hast thou gone take heart and let the thought of god allure thee further on dole not thy duties out to god but let thy hand be free look long at jesus his sweet love how was it dealt to thee the perfect way is hard to flesh it is not hard to love if thou wert sick for want of god how swiftly wouldst thou move and only this perfection needs a heart kept calm all day to catch the words the spirit there from hour to hour may say then keep thy conscience sensitive no inward token miss and go where grace entices thee perfection lies in this be docile to thine unseen guide love him as he loves thee time and obedience are enough and thou a saint shall be end of chapter eight recording by jeff chestnut
Chapter Nine of the Christian's Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith. Chapter Nine difficulties concerning doubts a great many christians are slaves to an inveterate habit of doubting i do not mean doubts as to the existence of god or the truths of the bible but doubts as to their own personal relations with the god in whom they profess to believe doubts as to the forgiveness of their sins doubts as to their hopes of heaven and doubts about their own inward experience no drunkard was more ever in bondage to his habit of drinking than they are to their habit of doubting every step of their spiritual progress is taken against the fearful odds of an army of doubts that are forever lying in wait to assail them at each favorable moment their lives are made wretched their usefulness is effectually hindered and their communion with god is continually broken by their doubts and although the entrance of the soul upon the life of faith does in many cases take it altogether out of the region where these doubts live and flourish yet even here it sometimes happens that the old tyrant will rise up and reassert his sway and will cause the feet to stumble and the heart to fail even when he cannot succeed in utterly turning the believer back into the dreary wilderness again we all of us remember doubtless our childish fascination and yet horror in the story of christian's imprisonment in doubting castle by the wicked giant despair and our exultant sympathy in his escape through those massive gates and from that cruel tyrant little did we suspect then that we should never find ourselves taken prisoner by the same giant and imprisoned in the same castle but i fear that each one of us if we were perfectly honest would have to confess to at least one such experience and some of us perhaps to a great many it seems strange that people whose very name of believers implies that their one chiefest characteristic is that they believe should have to confess that they have doubts and yet it is such a universal habit that i feel if the name were to be given over again the only fitting and descriptive name that could be given to many of god's children would have to be that of doubters in fact most christians have settled down under their doubts as to a sort of inevitable malady from which they suffer acutely but to which they must try to be resigned as a part of the necessary discipline of this earthly life and they lament over their doubts as a man might lament over his rheumatism making themselves out as interesting cases of a special and peculiar trial which require the tenderest sympathy and the utmost consideration this is too often true even of believers who are earnestly longing to enter upon the life and walk of faith and who have made perhaps many steps towards it they have got rid it may be of the old doubts that once tormented them as to whether their sins are really forgiven and whether they shall after all get safe to heaven but they have not got rid of doubting they have simply shifted the habit to a higher platform they are saying perhaps yes i believe my sins are forgiven and i am a child of god through faith in jesus christ i dare not doubt this any more but then and this but then includes an interminable array of doubts concerning most of the declarations and promises our father has made to his children one after another they fight with these promises and refuse to believe them until they can have some more reliable proof of their being true than the simple word of their god and when they wonder why they are permitted to walk in such darkness and look upon themselves almost in the light of martyrs and groan under the peculiar spiritual conflicts they are compelled to endure spiritual conflicts far better would they be named did we call them spiritual rebellions our fight is to be a fight of faith in the moment we let in doubts our fight ceases and our rebellion begins i desire to put forth if possible a vigorous protest against this whole thing and just as well might i join in with the laments of a drunkard and unite with him in prayer for grace to endure the discipline of his fatal appetite as to give way for one instant to the weak complaints of these enslaved souls and try to console them under their slavery to one and to the other i would dare to do nothing else but proclaim the perfect deliverance which the lord jesus christ has in store for them and beseech entreat and importune them 
with all the power at my command to avail themselves of it and be free not for one moment would i listen to their despairing excuses you ought to be free you can be free you must be free will you undertake to tell me that it is an inevitable necessity for god to be doubted by his children is it an inevitable necessity for your children to doubt you would you tolerate their doubts a single hour would you pity your son and condole with him and feel that he was an interesting case if he should come to you and say father i am such a doubter that i cannot believe i am your child or that you really love me and yet how often we hear a child of god excuse himself for his doubts by saying oh but i am such a doubter that i cannot believe in god's love and forgiveness and no one seems shocked at it you might just as well say with a like complacency oh but i am such a liar that i cannot help telling lies and expect people to consider it a sufficient excuse in the sight of god i verily believe doubting is in some cases as displeasing as lying it certainly is more dishonoring to him for it impugns his truthfulness and defames his character john says that he that believeth not god hath made him a liar and it seems to me that hardly anything could be worse than thus to fasten on god the character of being a liar have you ever thought of this as the result of your doubting i remember seeing once the indignation and sorrow of a mother's heart deeply stirred by a little doubting on the part of one of her children she had brought two little girls to my house to leave them while she did some errands one of them with the happy confidence of childhood abandoned herself to all the pleasures she could find in my nursery and she sang and played until her mother's return the other one with the wretched caution and mistrust of maturity sat down alone in a corner to wonder first whether her mother would remember to come back for her and to fear she would be forgotten and then to imagine her mother would be glad of the chance to get rid of her anyhow because she was such a naughty girl and ended with working herself up into a perfect frenzy of despair the look on that mother's face when upon her return the weeping little girl told what was the matter with her i shall not easily forget grief wounded love indignation and pity all strove together for mastery and the mother hardly knew who was most at fault herself or the child that such doubts should be possible perhaps such doubts might be possible with an earthly mother but never never with god and a hundred times in my life since has that scene come up before me with deepest teaching and has compelled me peremptorily to refuse admittance to the doubts about my heavenly father's love and care and remembrance of me that have clamored at the door of my heart for entrance doubting is i am convinced to many people a real luxury and to deny themselves this luxury would be the hardest piece of self-denial they have ever known it is a luxury which like the indulgence in some other luxuries brings very sorrowful results and perhaps looking at the sadness and misery it has brought into your own christian experience you may be inclined to say alas it is no luxury to me but only a fearful trial but pause for a moment try giving it up and you will soon find out whether it is a luxury or not do not your doubts come trooping to your door like a company of sympathizing friends who appreciate your hard case and have come to condole with you and is it no luxury to sit down with them and entertain them and listen to their arguments and join in with their condolences would it be no self-denial to turn resolutely from them and refuse to hear a word they have to say if you do not know try it and see have you never tasted the luxury of indulging in hard thoughts against those who have as you think injured you have you never known what a positive fascination it is to brood over their unkindness and to pry into their malice and to imagine all sorts of wrong and uncomfortable things about them it has made you wretched of course but it has been a fascinating sort of wretchedness that you could not easily give up just like this is the luxury of doubting things have gone wrong with you in your experience dispensations have been mysterious temptations have been peculiar your case has seemed different from others what more natural than to conclude that for some reason god has forsaken you and does not love you and is indifferent to your welfare how irresistible is the conviction that you are too wicked for him to care for or too difficult for him to manage you do not mean to blame him or accuse him of injustice for you feel that his indifference and rejection of you are because of your unworthiness fully deserved and this very subterfuge leaves you at liberty under the guise of a just and true appreciation of your own shortcomings to indulge in your dishonorable doubts although you think it is yourself you are doubting you are really doubting the lord and are indulging in as hard and wrong thoughts of him as ever you did of a human enemy for he declares that he came to save 
not the righteous, but sinners, and your very sinfulness and unworthiness, instead of being a reason why he should not love you and care for you, are really your chiefest claim upon his love and his care, as well might be the poor little lamb that has wandered from the flock and got lost in the wilderness, say, I am lost, and therefore the shepherd cannot love me, nor care for me, nor remember me. He only loves and cares for the lambs that never wander. As well might the ill man say, I am ill, and therefore the doctor will not come to see me, nor give me any medicine. He only cares for and visits well people. Jesus says, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And again he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? Any thoughts of him, therefore, that are different from this which he himself has said, are hard thoughts, and to indulge in them is far worse than to indulge hard thoughts of any earthly friend or foe. From beginning to end of your Christian life, it is always sinful to indulge in doubts. Doubts and discouragements are all from an evil source, and are always untrue. A direct and emphatic denial is the only way to meet them. This brings me to the practical part of the whole subject, as to how to get deliverance from this fatal habit. My answer would be that the deliverance from this must be by the same means as the deliverance from any other sin. It is to be found in Christ, and in Him only. You must hand your doubting over to Him, as you have learned to hand your other temptations. You must do it with just what you do, with your temper or your pride. That is, you must give it up to the Lord. I believe myself the only effectual remedy is to take a pledge against it, as you would urge a drunkard to do against drink trusting in the lord alone to keep you steadfast like any other sin the stronghold is in the will and the will or purpose to doubt must be surrendered exactly as you surrender the will or purpose to yield to any other temptation god always takes possession of a surrendered will and if we come to the point of saying that we will not doubt and surrender this central fortress of our nature to him his blessed spirit will begin at once to work in us all the good pleasure of his will and we shall find ourselves kept from doubting by his mighty and overcoming power the trouble is that in this matter of doubting the christian does not always make a full surrender but is apt to reserve a little secret liberty to doubt looking upon it as being sometimes a necessity i do not want to doubt any more we will say or i hope i shall not but it is hard to come to the point of saying i will not doubt again and no surrender is effectual until it reaches the point of saying, I will not. The liberty to doubt must be given up forever, and we must consent to a continuous life of inevitable trust. It is often necessary, I think, to make a definite transaction of this surrender of doubting, and come to a point about it. I believe it is quite as necessary in the case of a doubter as in the case of a drunkard. It will not do to give it up by degrees. The total abstinence principle is the only effectual one here. Then, the surrender once made we must rest absolutely upon the lord for deliverance in each time of temptation the moment the assault comes we must lift up the shield of faith against it we must hand the very first suggestion of doubt over to the lord and must let him manage it we must refuse to entertain the doubt a single moment let it come over so plausibly or under whatever guise of humility we must simply say i dare not doubt i must trust god is my father and he does love me jesus saves me he saves me now those three little words repeated over and over jesus saves me jesus saves me will put to flight the greatest army of doubts that ever assaulted any soul i have tried it times without number and have never known it to fail do not stop to argue out the matter with yourself or with your doubts pay no attention to them whatever but treat them with the utmost contempt shut your door in their very face and emphatically deny every word they say to you bring up some it is written and hurl it after them look right at jesus and tell him that you do trust him and that you intend to go on trusting him then let the doubts clamor as they may they cannot hurt you if you will not let them in i know it will look to you sometimes as though you were shutting your door against your best friends and your hearts will long after your doubts more than ever the israelites longed after the flesh pots of egypt but deny yourself take up your cross in this matter and quietly but firmly refuse ever to listen to a single word often it has happened to me to find on awakening in the morning a perfect army of doubts clamoring at my door for admittance nothing has seemed real nothing has seemed true 
and least of all has it seemed possible that i miserable wretched i could be the object of the lord's love care or notice if i only had been at liberty to let these doubts in and invite them to take seats and make themselves at home what a luxury i should many times have felt it to be but years ago i made a pledge against doubting and i would as soon think of violating my pledge against intoxicating liquor as of violating this one i have never dared to admit the first doubt at such times therefore i have been compelled to lift up the shield of faith the moment i have become conscious of these suggestions of doubt and handing the whole army over to the lord to conquer i have begun to assert over and over my faith in him in the simple words god is my father i am his forgiven child he does love me jesus saves me jesus saves me now the victory has always been complete the enemy has come in like a flood but the spirit of the lord has lifted up a standard against him and my doubts have been put to flight and i have been able to join in the song of moses and the children of israel saying i will sing unto the lord for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea the lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation dear doubting souls go and do likewise and a similar victory shall be yours you may think perhaps that doubts are a necessity in your case owing to the peculiarity of your temperament but i assure you most emphatically that this is not so you are no more under a necessity to be doubtful as to your relationships to your heavenly father than you are to be doubtful as to your relationships to your earthly father in both cases the thing you must depend on is their word not your feelings and no earthly father has ever declared him or manifested his fatherhood one thousandth part as unmistakably or as lovingly as your heavenly father has declared and manifested his if you would not make god a liar therefore you must make your believing as inevitable and necessary a thing as your obedience you would obey god i believe even though you should die in the act believe him also even though the effort to believe should cost you your life the conflict may be very severe it may seem at times unendurable but let your unchanging declaration be from henceforth though he slay me yet will i trust in him when doubts come meet them not with their arguments but with assertions of faith all doubts are an attack of the enemy the holy spirit never suggests them never he is the comforter not the accuser and he never shows us our need without at the same time revealing the divine supply do not give heed to your doubts therefore for a moment turn from them with horror as you would from blasphemy for they are blasphemy you cannot perhaps hinder the suggestions of doubt from coming to you any more than you can hinder the boys in the street from swearing as you go by and consequently you are not sinning in the one case any more than in the other but just as you can refuse to listen to the boys or join in their oaths so can you also refuse to listen to the doubts or join in with them they are not your doubts until you consent to them and adopt them as true when they come you must at once turn from them as you would from swearing often a very good practical way of getting rid of them is to go at once and confess your faith in the strongest language possible somewhere or to someone if you cannot do this by word of mouth write it in a letter or repeat it over and over in your heart to the lord as you lay down this book therefore take up your pen and write out your determination never to doubt again make it a real transaction between your soul and the lord give up your liberty to doubt forever put your will in this matter over on the lord's side and trust him to keep you from falling tell him all about your utter weakness and your long encouraged habits of doubt and how helpless you are before it and commit the whole battle to him tell him you will not doubt again putting forth all your will power on his side and against his enemy and yours and then henceforth keep your face steadfastly looking unto jesus away from yourself and away from your doubts holding fast the profession of your faith without wavering because he is faithful who hath promised rely on his faithfulness not on your own you have committed the keeping of your soul to him as unto a faithful creator and you must never again admit the possibility of his being unfaithful believe he is faithful not because you feel it or see it but because he says he is believe it whether you feel it or not believe it even when it seems to you that you are believing something that is absolutely untrue believe it actively and believe it persistently cultivate a continuous habit of believing and never let your faith waver for any seeming however plausible it may be the result will be that sooner or later you will come to know that it is true and all doubts will vanish in the blaze of the glory of the absolute faithfulness of god it is an explorable rule in the spiritual life that according to our faith 
it is to be unto us and of course this rule must work both ways and therefore we may fairly expect that it will be also unto us according to our doubts doubts and discouragements are i believe inlets by which evil enters while faith is an impregnable wall against all evil dear doubting souls my heart yearns over you with a tender sympathy i know your sincerity and your earnestness in your struggles after an abiding experience of peace with god through the lord jesus christ and i know also how effectually your fatal habit of doubting has held you back i would that my words might open your eyes to see the deliverance that lies at your very door try my plan i beseech of you and see if it will not be true that according to your faith it shall inevitably be unto you End of chapter 9 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 10 Of The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano the christian secret of a happy life by hannah whittall smith chapter 10 difficulties concerning temptations certain very great mistakes are made concerning this matter of temptation in the practical working out of the life of faith first of all people seem to expect that after the soul has entered into rest in the lord temptations will cease and they think that the promised deliverance is to be not only from yielding to temptation but even also from being tempted consequently when they find the canaanite still in the land and see the cities great and walled up to heaven they are utterly discouraged and think they must have gone wrong in some way and that this cannot be the true land after all then next they make the mistake of looking upon temptation as sin and of blaming themselves for suggestions of evil even while they abhor them this brings them into condemnation and discouragement and discouragement if continued in always ends at last in actual sin sin makes an easy prey of a discouraged soul so that we fall often from the very fear of having fallen to meet the first of these difficulties it is only necessary to refer to the scripture declarations which state that the christian life is to be throughout a warfare and that it is to be especially so when we are seated in heavenly places in christ jesus and are called to wrestle against spiritual enemies whose power and skill to tempt us must doubtless be far superior to any we have ever heretofore encountered as a fact temptations generally increase in strength tenfold after we have entered into the interior life rather than decrease and no amount or sort of them must ever for a moment lead us to suppose we have not really found the true abiding place strong temptations are often more a sign of great grace than of little grace when the children of israel had first left egypt the lord did not lead them through the country of the philistines although that was the nearest way for god said lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to egypt but afterwards when they had learned how to trust him better he permitted their enemies to attack them moreover even in their wilderness journey they met with but few enemies and fought but few battles compared to those they encountered in the land of canaan where they found seven great nations and thirty-one kings to be conquered besides walled cities to be taken and giants to be overcome they could not have fought with the canaanites and the hittites and the amorites and the parasites and the hivites and the jebusites until they had gone into the land where these enemies were the very power of your temptations dear christian therefore may perhaps be one of the strongest proofs that you really are in the land of promise you have been seeking to enter because they are temptations peculiar to that land consequently you must never allow them to cause you to question the fact of your having entered it the second mistake is not quite so easy to deal with it seems hardly worth while to say that temptation is not sin and yet much distress arises from not understanding this fact the very suggestion of wrong seems to bring pollution with it and the poor tempted soul begins to feel 
as if it must be very bad indeed and very far off from god to have had such thoughts and suggestions it is as though a burglar should break into a man's house to steal and when the master of the house begins to resist him and drive him out should turn round and accuse the owner of being himself the thief it is the enemy's grand ruse for entrapping us he comes and whispers suggestions of evil to us doubts blasphemies jealousies envyings and pride and then turns round and says oh how wicked you must be to think such things it is very plain that you are not trusting the lord for if you had been it would be impossible for these things to have entered your heart this reasoning sounds so very plausible that we often accept it as true and so come under condemnation and are filled with discouragement and then it is easy for temptation to develop into actual sin one of the most fatal things in the life of faith is discouragement one of the most helpful is confidence a very wise man once said that in overcoming temptations confidence was the first thing confidence the second and confidence the third we must expect to conquer that is why the lord said so often to joshua be strong and of a good courage be not afraid neither be thou dismayed only be thou strong and very courageous and it is also the reason he says to us let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid the power of temptation is in the fainting of our own hearts the enemy knows this well and he always begins his assaults by discouraging us if he can in any way accomplish it this discouragement arises sometimes from what we think is a righteous grief and disgust at ourselves that such things could be any temptation to us but which is really mortification coming from the fact that we have been indulging in a secret self-congratulation that our tastes were too pure or our separation from the world was too complete for such things to tempt us we are discouraged because we have been expected something from ourselves and have been sorely disappointed not to find that something there this mortification and discouragement though they present an appearance of true humility are really a far worse condition than the temptation itself for they are nothing but the results of wounded self-love true humility can bear to see its own utter weakness and foolishness revealed because it never expected anything from itself and knows that its only hope and expectation must be in god therefore instead of discouraging the humble soul from trusting such revelations drive it to a deeper and more utter trust but the counterfeit humility that self-love produces plunges the soul into the depths of a faithless discouragement and drives it into the very sin with which it is so distressed there is an allegory that illustrates this to me wonderfully satan called together a council of his servants to consult how they might make a good man sin one evil spirit started up and said i will make him sin how will you do it asked satan i will set before him the pleasures of sin was the reply i will tell him of its delights and the rich rewards it brings ah said satan that will not do he has tried it and knows better than that then another imp started up and said i will make him sin what will you do asked satan i will tell him of the pains and sorrows of virtue i will show him that virtue has no delights and brings no rewards ah no exclaimed satan that will not do at all for he has tried it and knows that wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace well said another imp starting up i will undertake to make him sin and what will you do asked satan again i will discourage his soul was the short reply ah that will do cried satan that will do we shall conquer him now an old writer says all discouragement is from the devil and i wish every christian would take this as a motto and would realize that he must fly from discouragement as he would from sin but if we fail to recognize the truth about temptation this is impossible for if the temptations are our own fault we cannot help being discouraged but they are not the bible says blessed is the man that endureth temptation and we are exhorted to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations temptation therefore cannot be sin and the truth is it is no more a sin to hear these whispers and suggestions of evil in our souls than it is for us to hear the wicked talk of bad men as we pass along the street the sin comes in either case only by our stopping and joining in with them if when the wicked suggestions come we turn from them at once as we would from wicked talk and pay no more attention to them than we would to the talk we do not sin but if we carry them on in our minds 
and roll them under our tongues and dwell on them with a half consent of our will to them as true then we sin we may be enticed by temptations a thousand times a day without sin and we cannot help these enticings and are not to blame for them but if we begin to think that these enticings are actual sin on our part then the battle is half lost already and the sin can hardly fail to gain a complete victory a dear lady once came to me under great darkness simply from not understanding this she had been living very happily in the life of faith for some time and had been so free from temptation as almost to begin to think she would never be tempted again but suddenly a very peculiar form of temptation had assailed her which had horrified her she found that the moment she began to pray dreadful thoughts of all kinds would rush into her mind she had lived a very sheltered innocent life and these thoughts seemed so awful to her that she felt she must be one of the most wicked of sinners to be capable of having them she began by thinking that she could not possibly have entered into the rest of faith and ended by concluding that she had never even been born again her soul was in an agony of distress i told her that these dreadful thoughts were purely and simply temptations and that she herself was not to blame for them at all that she could not help them any more than she could help hearing if a wicked man should pour out his blasphemies in her presence and i urged her to recognize and treat them as temptations only and not to blame herself or be discouraged but rather to turn at once to the lord and commit them to him i showed her how great an advantage the enemy had gained by making her think these thoughts were originated by herself and by plunging her into condemnation and discouragement on account of them and i assured her she would find a speedy victory if she would pay no attention to them but ignoring their presence would simply turn her back on them and look to the lord she grasped the truth and the next time these blasphemous thoughts came she said inwardly to the enemy i have found you out now it is you who are suggesting these dreadful thoughts to me and i hate them and will have nothing to do with them the lord is my helper take them to him and settle them in his presence immediately the baffled enemy finding himself discovered fled in confusion and her soul was perfectly delivered another thing also our spiritual enemies know that if a christian recognizes a suggestion of evil as coming from them he will recoil from it far more quickly than if it seems to be the suggestion of his own mind if the devil prefaced each temptation with the words i am the devil your relentless enemy i have come to make you sin i suppose we would hardly feel any desire at all to yield to his suggestions he has to hide himself in order to make his baits attractive and our victory will be far more easily gained if we are not ignorant of his devices but recognize them at his very first approach we also make another great mistake about temptations in thinking that all time spent in combating them is lost hours pass and we seem to have made no progress because we have been so beset with temptations but it often happens that we have been serving god far more truly during these hours than in our times of comparative freedom from temptation for we are fighting our lord's battles when we are fighting temptation and hours are often worth days to us under these circumstances we read blessed is the man that endureth temptation and i am sure this means enduring the continuance of it in its frequent recurrence nothing so cultivates the grace of patience as the endurance of temptation and nothing so drives the soul to an utter dependence upon the lord jesus as its continuance and finally nothing brings more praise and honor and glory to our lord himself than the trial of our faith that comes through manifold temptations we are told that it is more precious than gold though it be tried with fire and that we who patiently endure the trial shall receive for our reward the crown of life which the lord hath promised to them that love him we cannot wonder therefore any longer at the exhortation with which the holy ghost opens the book of james count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing temptation is plainly one of the instruments used by god to complete our perfection and thus sin's own weapons are turned against itself and we see how it is that all things even temptations can work together for good to them that love god as to the way of victory over temptation it seems hardly necessary to say to those whom i am at this time especially addressing that it is to be by faith for this is of course the foundation upon which the whole interior life rests 
our one great motto is throughout we are nothing christ is all and always and everywhere we have started out to stand and walk and overcome and live by faith we have discovered our own utter helplessness and know that we cannot do anything for ourselves and we have learned that our only way therefore is to hand the temptation over to our lord and trust him to conquer it for us but when we put it into his hands we must leave it there the greatest difficulty of all is i think this leaving it seems impossible to believe that the lord can or will manage our temptations without our help especially if they do not immediately disappear to go on patiently enduring the continuance of a temptation without yielding to it and also without snatching ourselves out of the lord's hands in regard to it is a wonderful victory for our impatient natures but it is a victory we must gain if we would do what will please god we must then commit ourselves as really to the lord for victory over our temptations as we committed ourselves at first for forgiveness and we must leave ourselves just as utterly in his hands for one as for the other thousands of god's children have done this and can testify today that marvelous victories have been gained for them over numberless temptations and that they have in very truth been made more than conquerors through him who loves them but into this part of the subject i cannot go at present as my object has been rather to present temptation in its true light than to develop the way of victory over it i desire greatly that conscientious faithful souls should be delivered from the bondage into which they are sure to be brought if they fail to understand the true nature and use of temptation and confound it with sin when temptation is recognized as temptation we shall be able to say at once get thee behind me and shall walk even through the midst of the fiercest assaults with unclouded and triumphant peace knowing that when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the lord shall lift up a standard against him end of chapter 10 recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida